You are listening to the Mead and Cheese Extra Large Special. I'm DJ Mead. DJ Cheese has just momentarily left the studio. But yes, we are here. We are in the studio. We are going to be here from now until 7 p.m. So if you would like to listen to some Mead and Cheese for the rest of your afternoon, feel free to listen in. Mead and cheese. Mead, mead, mead and cheese. Mead and cheese. This is mead and cheese, and I am currently alone in the studio as uh, Lord Jackson has gone to fetch some equipment from AV Loans. However, while I am alone, I figured I would do a BuzzFeed quiz on what kind of cheese are you? So um, I have to pick a holiday destination. My choices are New York, Austin, Portland, or New Orleans. Um, I think I'll go for Austin, uh, Texas. Sounds sounds nice. Uh, I've got to pick a food. So I've got pizza, uh, a nice looking sandwich, some spaghetti bolognese, and a burger with some chips. Uh, I'm going to go for the pizza, I think, because who doesn't love a good pizza? Now I've got to pick which home I would rather live in. Uh, I could go for like a luxury um, apartment, um, or just, you know, a more modern apartment. Or I could go for, you know, a nice little house, little wooden house. Or I could live on a mountain. Now, you know me, I'm a lord, um, Lord Mead. And I feel like a lord needs to live high up on a mountain to look down on uh, all of his subjects and uh, make sure that they're drinking the proper mead. So I'm, I'm going to go for the mountain. Now it's asking me to pick a car. And... Um, I'm not even going to think about it. I'm going to go for the most pristine car on here, which uh, just it looks like some blue uh, retro sort of car. So I'm going to go for that. And now I've got to pick a drink. Do I go for Coca-Cola, red red wine, um, a glass of water, or a pint of beer? Now I'm very disappointed that they don't have mead on this list. Um, that is very disappointing. I am a huge Coca-Cola fan. Um, I also like my wine and my beer. But um, just for the hydration factor, I think I'm going to pick uh, water. So, there we go. I am blue cheese. That is outrageous. I am not a blue cheese. I am not mouldy. I am not disgusting. I don't stink that bad, at least. Um, no, I am outraged by that result. I think BuzzFeed have got it all wrong. Um, I think they need to sort out their cheese quiz and fire whoever, whoever made this. Who made this? Um, Casey. Oh, a community contributor. Well, Casey, if I, if I were BuzzFeed, I would delete that quiz because I am not a mouldy, stinky blue cheese. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's a it's a nice quiz. I imagine I probably got blue cheese because uh, as a lord, you know blue cheese is sophisticated, or it seemed to be, you know, more of a delicacy. And uh, you know, as a lord who likes his mead, uh, blue cheese uh, fits my uh, you know uh, pristine lifestyle. So um, I, I'm going to say that um, as opposed to the mold and the smelly factor. So maybe the quiz isn't that bad after all. Uh, but yeah, that's just me, I suppose. This is Leicester's Student Sound, Demon FM. Welcome back to Mead and Cheese. I am DJ Mead, joined by a special guest, the worst chemist in the world, Alex Graney. Hello there. (laughs) Um, Alex, you know a lot about chemistry. I thought you said I was the worst chemist. (laughs) Um, The process of... uh, making an alcoholic drink, what is that called? 
So the process of making an alcohol um, is, ferment, uh, is fermentation, isn't it? I believe it is, yeah. And when you oxidise an alcohol with um, an open space, what does that alcohol become? When you oxidise, well, it depends on the alcohol. Uh, it could be a primary tertiary alkene, but alcohol is maybe oxidised to give a ketone or a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid. That is um, in an enclosed environment, isn't it, for carboxylic acid? Yes, and I believe ketones are in the open environment. Yes. Does um does an alcohol also become an aldehyde um, if the lid's left open? I believe so. I'm not really sure how it works. I think it can either be an aldehyde, a ketone, or a carboxylic acid, depending on the other conditions, including, like you said, room temperature, uh, including the double bonds on the alcohol group as well. Yeah. So, um, Alex, why are you the worst chemist? <laughs> Lack of incentive would probably be what I'd put it down to at the time. Um, motivation was very low coming towards the exam period. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm the worst of two, so I'm also second best. It's worth keeping in mind. The so second a best of, chemist, yeah. A number of chemists actually failed it, so I'm not really the worst. I'm just the least bad. Now, I'm, I'm the least good of the ones that passed. Well, um, as um, our good friend Andrew would say, um, the worst chemist is actually Graham Lean, if it's not. Yes, it is. Graham Lean. Yes. Well, that being said, I'm, fa- I'm fairly sure despite being better chemist in terms of our grades and academic performance, we were probably much more inconvenient students to work with. I think we were probably the worst students to have, just because we would, like, have acid fights during practicals. Yeah. I will never forget the disappointed look on Andy's <laughs> face when he walked in to find you and me had stacked a bunch of clamp stands on his chair and were running around the room spraying each other with acid. <laughs> oh, you remember um, when we had that substitute teacher come in in the next room and his accent kept changing every five minutes? <laughs> yeah, we could hear him through the wall every time. <laughs> and we just kept trying to guess what his accent was. <laughs> What did it? What actually was he in the end? Did we ever figure it out where he was from? I, I don't think we did, because cause like I say, his accent changed every five minutes, didn't it? Like he started off Jamaican and then he sounded German. He sounded um, sort of American for one period as well. Yeah, it was. And then Irish. It was interesting. Um, maybe it was like being possessed by a bunch of different ghosts. Maybe. Um, but ghosts aren't time. real, by the way, on the radio. We're not allowed to talk about ghosts. What was that? Sorry. Uh, we're not allowed to talk about ghosts on the radio, and I just said uh, ghosts, so... Ah. Yeah. Well, your show was good while it lasted. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> Perhaps it was our head teacher at the time. We're not allowed to name names, so I'll just call him Mavid Dackey. Um, <laughs> Mavid Dackey, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps uh, he was an Irish fellow. Perhaps he was having a stroke and he was just changing his <laughs> voice every five minutes. That, that that would explain it, yeah. Because you did sound Irish to begin with. I mean, the best thing about that lesson, though, was the Year 7s coming through um, with the um, with the, the clamp stand. stand yeah. And they said, oh, where are we meant to put these? And we said, oh, Andy said just to leave them all on his chair. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part is he never owned up to it, so he just thought all of those Year 7s would be a bit... <laughs> Oh man, some year sevens got told off and it was purely just us being, yeah, just messing around. To be fair, I was always a bit of a trouble cause of it. I remember, obviously you weren't in our class at the time, but when I was doing GCSE English, yeah. um, a few of us would like make stupid noises when the teacher wasn't looking or when they were out of the room. <laughs> and um, well, you'll know them, it was me, Jack Chris, and Alistair Steele. And... I remember once, like, we were doing it in the lesson, the teacher was in there, just had a back to the whiteboard, couldn't figure out who it was, <laughs> and I did one more, and she thought it was Alistair, and I, <laughs> I didn't know enough to it, he didn't get a chance to explain that it was me, she just kicked him straight out, <laughs> for something he didn't do. That's amazing. But do, yeah. Do you remember I when... I feel like I probably made the teacher's lives a bit miserable, but... 
I think we made it more fun for them, you know. Yeah, I think as much as we were inconvenient and annoying at times, we made it a lot less boring for ourselves and the teachers. I, I would agree. Do you remember um, when the other chemistry teacher, Tess Geel, would... Um, yeah. When she purposefully marked our papers down and we um, did like a full on investigation into it and found it guilty. <laughs> did we ever actually confront her about that or did we just hate uh, her in silence? I think I think we did because um, I, I think we I think we might have told on her to Andy and said, Andy, she's marked us as like an E and we should be like a D or a C. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember that. I was quite disappointed. But I must admit, it was it was a cheeky tactic because she had me thinking, oh, I've got to work hard, but I'm not going to pass. <laughs> so if we hadn't have been so determined to find a loophole in the way that we did, uh, it would have been quite the tactic from Tess. Yes, but we, we got her back in the end because uh, she always had that door that we weren't allowed to use. And at the end of the year, I got a nice photo of you uh, using that door. It was a great door. I think it was quite... I'm, I'm disappointed that it wasn't made a sort of publicly available door. I mean, obviously, they can't really do it because it's built into a classroom, but you, you'd skip, like, half of the school by going through that one door. It was fantastic. I agree. I agree 100%. Um, Alex, do you remember Big Boy News? I remember Big Boy News. The newsletter that was delivered for about three weeks and then stopped. <laughs> I remember it fondly, actually. I remember being uh, one of the headlines, I believe, one week as well. You some, you were involved that, in... I believe it was yeah. because of the meme page, um, which myself and a few associates who I won't name created at the time. Yeah. No, I believe I've... the... I'll, I'll, I'll just give the... I'll, I'll give the um, associates aliases. There was Daffy Mutton, um, <laughs> Moni Raffu, and... Um, Sword and Jobs, <laughs> yeah, um, and those uh, those individuals did support the meme page and made some great content. No, but I, I think you were a lot of uh, big boy news headlines, actually, especially I in like the you first few issues. I think I did it to inconvenience week. everyone, to be honest. Yeah, I remember one week you just got bored and you ran out of headlines so you just completely made up a bunch of news just to try and annoy everybody as much as possible. Well, uh, one of my friends recently um, found some copies of Big Boy News that I thought were just lost to the ages. Um, so later on on the show, I think I'm going to read out some of the Big Boy News articles that I wrote. Brilliant, I love that. Because, uh, yeah. How many did you do? I think you did about four or five copies, didn't you? I think I did about five issues. Um, issue mm. five was a double page special because I wanted to go out on a bang. Ah, the Simon Hutchinson special, the double page. The the Hyman Hutchinson. Ah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read out some big boy news um, in a little while. This is Leicester's Student Sound. Demon FM. This is Leicester's Student Sound. I'm okay. DJ Mead, and now we have, in the studio, the one and only. Hello. <laughs> DJ <laughs> Cheese. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, ever. You don't, you don't like your name, do you? No. Are you, are you still sticking to that campaign that you want to change your name? Yeah. yeah. Also, as Liz said the other day, you're, it's, this show is all about Mead. It needs to be more about Cheese. Well, I did do a cheese quiz while you were gone. How did that go? It went okay, I think, yeah. It was um, it was a bit disappointing that I yeah. got blue cheese as my result, because blue cheese is a bit stinky, isn't it, and mouldy. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose it is. But then I, I sort of twisted it and I said, no, yeah. I got blue cheese because it's seen as a delicacy for my, my regal lordship lifestyle. Yeah. So, um, yeah... That's that's how I twisted it. Um, yeah, we had Alex on, um, Alex Graney, just uh, previously before we went to a song break, and we were talking about big boy news. Do you do you want to know what big boy news is, Tom? I feel feel like it's something what's very cringe. <laughs> so when I was at school, I uh, started writing my own version of like a school newspaper. Yeah 
called Big Boy News. Um, and what it was, I'd just print off like a sheet of A4 paper um, and give it out to a bunch of students to read. And it was just like fake news stories about the school. Okay. Um, okay. And I, I think some of them are actually pretty funny. Um, so just some context. The school was... Um, it recently become an academy. And uh, the academy trust was bringing in a lot of strict rules to do with like dress codes and yeah. things like that. So um, I took advantage of that and, uh, yeah, wrote some news articles. I didn't save any of these, so I thought they were lost to time. But my friend Alistair sent some copies over that he found, so I'm going to read them out. So Big Boy News Volume 4. Impero becomes a banned word on Impero, causing Impero to ban Impero. School systems implode. The school software known as Impero has been the bane of many students at the school by banning every Google image search containing Roblox. Impero has now caused a huge issue when the word Impero was mysteriously added to the ban list, which caused the software to ban itself and the school systems to implode. <laughs> you, you're not... You're not liking that? I don't know what the... It would just sound like a load of gibberish. Sports teacher caught wearing trainers sacked. A sports teacher at school was caught wearing trainers during a PE lesson. As trainers are not a part of the school dress code, this teacher has been fired for not setting a good example. For future reference, PE teachers have been advised to teach their lessons in formal attire. That one was more, um, more like, like believable. I feel like a school would do that. Do you reckon? Yeah, these days, yeah, hundred percent. A school has non-binding ref- referendum on whether to leave their academy trust. There is an upcoming referendum on whether the school will leave the academy trust or remain a member. Remain yeah. campaigners from the school governing board have said, if we don't like the result, we won't do it. So, so what sort of, like, readership did you have? Uh, we had pretty good readership. Uh, like I say, I just printed off a load of copies in the library and uh, just handed them out around school. You handed them out? Well, I'd hand them out. I would, like, uh, stick them in people's lockers. Yeah. Um, just anything, really. To put them up on the wall uh, so anyone could read it. It was mainly six formers, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Big Boy News, Volume 5, the double page edition. New school dress code requires students to have logo tattooed on foreheads. The school has recently announced a new update to their stricter dress code. It claims that all students must now have tattoos of the school logo on their foreheads. The school governing board has made a statement saying that this will make students more recognisable as a part of the school. Yeah. Another member of staff who will remain anonymous has said, this is a great way to remove any individuality from students. I love it. Although the tattoo has been approved, other tattoos are still banned under the dress code. So what, um, what, uh, what, did, uh, what, what did the uni think to all of us? What did the school think? Yeah, like... Well, <laughs> they, they had no way of proving it was me who made them. They could just look on your account and the printing history. <laughs> I think the teachers secretly enjoyed it, you know. Did they? What did they? What was the official stance of the school? Um, the official stance of the school was to ignore it. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It it doesn't exist. If I if I was a teacher, I'd I'd ignore it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of the ones that I like stuck up around the walls would get taken down. Uh, but overall, I think people enjoyed it yeah. a lot. Um, yeah. School to replace isolation with a school prison. A recent statement from the school governors has suggested that isolation will be replaced with a full-size school prison, complete with its own canteen and prison staff. Sources say that the school prison will also include a death sentence for students who fail to hit their target grades. It is also rumoured that just outside the prison will be a new subway. 
<sighs> yeah. Th- this is the sort of stuff I would uh, write. Get, get up to, yeah. Yeah. I I never spent my free periods actually studying. I just made memes and wrote fake news about the school. Because <sighs> what else are you supposed to do? I don't know really what I did in my... I can't remember what I did in my free periods. Do you not? I used right. to go up to the shop and some of them, and then they tried to, you know, stop you from going up to the shop. They had to, like, to leave the school, they wanted you to have, like, sign out and sign in, like, have, a, like, a break uh, yeah. pass. But then, like, if you went slightly earlier, you could uh, get, you know, you, obviously no one would be at the gate looking at the break passes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, there was a teacher at our school who I'm going to call uh, Gandhi Ray. Yeah. Okay, and he was um, a very, you know, like, we're going to do this from the book sort of teacher. Like, he was very, um, he'd stand at the front, deliver the lesson in a monotone voice. Um, You know, he he wasn't exciting. He was a very nice guy, and he was exciting in his own way. But, you know, he was a bit of a... A bit boring. A a bit of a... From the outside, yeah. Like, when you got to know him better, he was actually an interesting guy, which is the interesting thing. But, yeah. So, um, Gandhi Ray, unable to renew contract with school, as it requires him to prove he is not a robot. The King of Alcanes, Gandhi Ray has recently told Big Boy News that he was unable to sign his new contract with the school as he was unable to prove that he was not a robot. Mr Gray was unable to complete the recapture as he could not find all images with cats in them. This has led many students to speculate that Gandhi Ray is in fact a robot and some have recalled him sweating coolant during practical lessons. I like it. I I like it. I I think it's, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting, interesting thing. (laughs) Um, Yeah. (laughs) Alex Grain has just messaged. um, He remembers the Andy Gray report. Andy Gray report. (laughs) Or should I say Gandhi Ray? Um, Should we go to some music, Tom? Yeah, we'll go music. Should we uh, get some Cher Lloyd? Uh, that would be amazing. Yes, because on Mead and Cheese, we are huge Cher Lloyd super fans, yeah. aren't we, Tom? We are. We are super fans of Cher Lloyd. So uh, this is Want You Back by Cher Lloyd. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. How are you doing today, Corey? I'm all right, mate. How are you? I am good. And how are you doing, our lovely audience? You are here today for an extra long episode of Mead and Cheese. We have a lot to discuss today. We have a lot to discuss. We will have some guests on later. We might have an appearance of the Mr. Thomas Dye, who will come on to talk on some of our segments today. But um, at the minute, you just stuck with us too. Um, we've taken over. We're now covering the Ed Show. Um, and then we're going to then be covering Late Nights with Leroy. Yes, and after that, I believe we will be covering S- the station manager's own show. Socials with Society. Yeah. So, Tom, you are the chairman of Demon Media. Yes, I am the current chairperson of Demon Media and um, chief videographer of Demon FM. And I am the current vice chairman of Demon Media. Yes. Um, and the elections are now up for next year's committee. Yeah, yeah, yes, they are. I can confirm. And um, there is only one candidate for the chair position. And um, reopen nominations. Don't forget reopen nominations, Ron. Yes, yes, I can't, I can't forget Ron. But um, who, who is the favourite to win the chairship, Tom? Ron. <laughs> uh, I think it's going to be a close batch. I think it's going to be close, you know, as always. Um, but I think the person who does win will always be the best for the job. Absolutely, yeah. So, obviously, with just you running for chairperson, it's pretty much guaranteed there will be a transition of power from me to you at some point. Yes, yes. That is. How do you feel about that? Um, being next in line for the chairship is um, a pretty big deal, I think. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I want to 
try and make Demon Media the best society that it can be. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to push for a lot more um, strand interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I don't... I don't like this attitude that a lot of people seem to have where, you know, you can only do stuff for one strand and that the strands yeah. are competing with each other. I want I want it to be less of a competition and more that the strands are collaborating and working together. I do feel like this year like this year is in compared to last year, we have we have like made it more of a community. That was my main goal going in was community first. Like I would want it to be yeah i would want it to be community first but um with that you know we i my second goal was to give great opportunities to content creating and then um thirdly i wanted to um you know just have like so people could build up their mm-hmm. portfolios but then have like consistent content and i think in some of them regards we've done quite well like radio now has a full schedule yeah um we've We've also, I feel like the commu- sense of community in Demon Media is a lot better. I feel like the socials, there's a, you've seen our massive turnout since Jack took over. Yeah, yeah, Jack's done a great job as social sec yeah. and uh, you were speaking about the radio and um, Maddie has done a great job Yeah, yeah. Um, as the station manager for FM this year. And yeah. like you say, FM has uh, had a really strong year um, and it's, um, in my opinion, this year been probably the strongest part of demon media yeah yeah um and we um and we can't like and you know i think the next committee who come in are gonna keep i hope they keep that sort of community sort of driven um yeah because i think uh, what my philosophy is is you know let's do really cool things let's do let's make great content let's like push ourselves really hard yeah. But there's no reason that has to be feel like a bureaucracy. There's no reason that has to feel like a big business. No, we can exactly, we yeah. can do really cool things and not be serious about it, you know. Be friends and then I feel like that makes better content. No, I agree 100%. I, I think that, you know, e- even if there is a lot of work to do and you're making a lot of content, it, it shouldn't feel like it's work. It should feel like you're having fun with it. Yeah. Um. But I, d- I do want to put a big focus on Demon TV next year. Um, I've been involved with um, FM and the magazine uh, throughout my time with Demon, uh, but I've not really been involved with the TV as much, so that's what I want to kind of okay. focus on. Do we have someone here? Yeah, some people at the door. Oh, we, we have people wanting to come into the studio. We will go to a song break, and uh, then we will see what is going on with our new guest, potentially. This is your student sound. Demon FM. We are just sexy boys. We are not boy toys, but we are sexy boys. Yes. So, uh, yeah, before we were uh, interrupted uh, for a quick uh, maintenance uh, check of the studio. Yeah, they fixed the clock Uh, in here, which was, um, for some reason fell down onto his monitor when we came in. Yeah, for the the clock exploded. Uh, the studio was on fire. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no. The, the, no. There, there, uh, yeah, there are there are just bodies everywhere. It's um, a cool clock though. Like, obviously, you can't see it on the radio, but it's it's ticking. It's ticking round. It's ticking. It's talking. Yeah, it says it's, it's all around three forty at the minute. And 55 seconds, or 56 now. But, um, yeah, it, it is a cool clock. Um, now, that brings up something I wanted to talk about today. Go on. Um, clocks. clocks. What do you prefer, digital um, or analogue? Digital or analogue? I feel like this is a discussion we can have about a great many things. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to clocks... Uh, I, th- I think obviously digital is more convenient. Yeah, it's a lot faster to read. You don't have to do the maths. Um, you know, I, I could just whack out my phone, and it just tells me, "Oh, it's seven o'clock." And I'm yeah. like, "Okay, it's seven o'clock." Uh, but to me personally, if you're going for style, okay, because yeah. analog has style, but that the digital clocks lack. And um, for me, I, I would go for a grandfather clock. Just the big, 
yeah. the big grandfather clock and it's got to go gong, gong every hour. That that to me is the perfect clock. Yeah. What about yourself? I like a fog watch. I actually have a collection of fog watches or pocket watches. Nice. Um, I, I can't read them very well because obviously I'm stupid and <laughs> I maybe do like digital but I um God I do I millennials co- I collect them yeah I can yeah. sort of tell the time on them now like the time obviously it's three forty but it says it there so it's like an easy it's easy it's easy yeah I I got no problem reading analog clocks I I don't find I don't think it's difficult it's just um you know the digital clocks are, are the convenience the analog st- yeah. clocks are the style I suppose you don't really need a watch anymore if you got your phone like I don't. The only time I started using a watch to tell the time when I when I had my phone on me was when I had a, like a Fitbit sort of thing, because um, mm. it would just be on like my wrist and I'd just do like move my wrist back a bit and it'd just tell me the time. Yeah. Um, but like I find how when I have a, just a normal watch on, most of the time it's not even set to the time. I just use my phone. Yeah, I've not used a watch in uh, years. Because they are stylish, though. Watches are important to wear still, because they show that you're organised to people. I don't know. I, I I don't know if you need a watch. I, 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 no, I think, like, it's like, it's do you need a hat, you know? You, you don't always do, but sometimes it looks cool. Like, a watch is an accessory now, I think. It, yeah, it's definitely more it's not, of an accessory than something you yeah, need now. It's, it's a statement, not a tool. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's style over substance now. Yeah. yeah, which I think then when it is style over substance, I think the analog wrist watch is the coolest. What about an analog pocket watch? Uh, yeah, no, they're, they're even cooler, but they're like proper, proper classy. They are um, on another level of class. Yeah, I, I'd I'd agree with that. And nurses use them a lot as well. Pocket watches. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure why. They could have it on their like pocket and, you know, they just have their button. If I had to guess, I would say that it's because they can't have stuff on their wrists because they have to, like, take gloves on an awful lot. Yeah, I think that actually is the thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be it. And but... keep the hands sanitised and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, we were talking about uh, next year's Demon Committee and the current elections that are going on. Yeah, so... I mean, there's a lot of one one people. It looks like, from what I looked, there's a lot of only one people running for positions. There's only a few um, peep t- situations where there's two people running yeah. um, for one position. But I think it's going to be a very strong strong committee. I think um, I think we're probably going to see the reemergence of Maddie as station manager of FM, which I'm excited to see. Yes, what that will be like yes, within another year of her. Not guaranteed, but yes. I'm you know, I've got my hopes up for that. Because FM is a it's a two horse race at the moment. It is between Maddie Maddie Forster and Kieran Shea. Yeah. Who of course Kieran Shea is enemy number one of Maddie <laughs> Cheese. No yeah, no, because he he's not our enemy though. Like he, he is our enemy because he, he stole pitch invasion from us. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, I think Maddie. Obviously, I'm a bit biased because Maddie's my partner, but I think she's done a fantastic job this year. She really has delivered and levelled up Demon FM, and I think, like with her, another term, she would continue to level up Demon FM. Well, as I was saying before, right, I do believe that Demon FM has been one of the strongest aspects of Demon Media as a whole this year. And uh, I think it's been very well run, and Maddie yeah. has a lot to be very proud of. Yeah, the, I, I think the whole Demon FM community should be proud. Like, like everyone's done really well. Tom Dye's done really well as schedule manager. Yeah. Um, one day, I actually would like to see Tom Dye's head of Demon FM maybe next year. Um, Kieran's done a good job as deputy. Brought a, he's got a good movie show, uh, which obviously we helped him with with the pitch invasion idea. Yeah, we we, we gave him all of his good ideas. Um, th- in fact, I believe the movie show was our idea as well. Yeah, yeah, I think may possibly. I can't. We have so many good ideas. That's uh, a problem. Uh, and I think you know we were the ones who said, "Oh, Kieran, you you should um, you should get involved with radio." 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, you know, we were, we were the ones who who gave him the name Kieran She. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I think like you've also got like Evan, who's such a great spirit, who's sort of so enthusiastic about everything, and I think that's a sort of like attitude you need in in a in a student radio. Speaking of uh, Evan, DJ your boy. Yeah. He has run for director of news. He has, yeah. Unopposed. Unopposed. So that means he... And I'll be interested to see what, what he does with that. Because um, obviously that is another position which um, wasn't actually... Wasn't... Um, what is one way you can sort of change it each year, I feel like. Because it's not a... It's not running yeah. a actual station. It's directing the news. No, I I agree with you, and I I imagine in my head that the director of news is this sort of cross strand figure, yeah, who um, sort of you know goes on the radio, TV, and the magazine, um, giving news stories. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Uh, but yeah, what what other positions is there? There's the uh, health and safety. Health and safety, I think Lou is going for that. Yeah. God knows why people want to do health and safety. No, I shouldn't. No, Ed, Ed is our current health and safety. He's done a great, great job at keeping the station healthy, hasn't he? And safe, yeah. And safe, safe. Yeah. Safe. Um, hopefully we'll see him next week on Mead and Cheese or possibly the week after, depending on when people arrive back. Um, but yeah, I think... I think like Ed and Lou, I would recommend them having a meeting, you know, talking about how to keep the station healthy, how to keep everything safe. Of course. And um, we, we also have Demon TV, which um, this year's social sec, Jack Davis has run for. And he's on the post, so he'll be, um, hopefully, station on TV. And I think... Uh, I think he'll do a good job. I think he's going to do a good job. Um, I, I, I've, I've spoken to he's spoken to to me about it a few times about his intention to run for TV, and you know, obviously, I try and encourage people to go for these positions, and I think he's gonna really do some good things, and I think, I think he'll work well with whoever's in charge of FM. If Maddie's in charge, I think they'll both work really well together, and yeah. I think, I think, hopefully, in the new committee, there'll be a real strong sense of community, um, and like. One of the approaches I considered at the beginning of this year, which didn't really, uh, I feel like because it was doing it halfway across the year, it wouldn't have worked as much as well as I liked it. But it was instead of having um, free membership meetings a week where it's TV's meeting, radio meeting and magazines meeting, yeah. I was sort of running with an idea where every other week you would have a joint membership meeting with all three strands Yes. So so it feels like yeah. you're not just going... So it, for me, that felt like it was one society rather than three little societies in one big thing. And then... So you would hear the FN opportunities, um, radio opportunities, and magazine opportunities. So people could come in... Because I generally find that people... Like, I've served in every single strand, and I know you yeah. have too. Mm -hmm. And I think I find that people don't have a niche as such like they might they might love camera work like that was me i love camera work but i come on to the, i've came onto the radio and i've really enjoyed that too and i feel like that would be most people um Th that's the thing with demon media and i feel like um this year it has sort of turned into um free societies yeah and um, I, I, where you know tv doesn't interact with magazine and fm magazine doesn't interact with tv and fm and fm doesn't interact that, with tv and magazine that has changed recently though because a lot of the guys from tv now have radio shows and the socials have brought everyone together like um mm. like the whole you can see because of the new socials being moved to bowling green made it all sort of um more inclusive i think yeah but um but but, but the big thing that i want to push for for next year um in the demon media society is for more cross-strand connectivity I, I don't want this thing of oh i'm a tv guy so i can only get involved with tv yeah I, you know i i want it to be you know you pay for a membership for demon media yeah so to get the most out of it you should be getting involved with all three strands and yeah and, and that's like you say in my manifesto i um 
said exactly what you said, where, you know, I don't want these individual strand meetings. I want the meetings to involve all all the strands. Yeah, I, I still think there's a place for individual strand meetings, like, um, particularly with workshops. Like, Well, it, yeah, workshops are a different thing, though. Not really. Like, I, I feel like if um, if you're having a meeting with your group, sometimes it is you have a meeting and you do it as a workshop like there was a few workshops that maddie did were really good like and got people involved um so there's one where we did the jingles in the other room for the fm and what we did in that workshop is that we had quite a few new members a few old ones had a little meeting in little chat and then went into the audio booths and we just um not the audio booths the the uh recording booths the podcast studios no no the recording one so there's there's a big there's a big like audio station on one side and then in, there's a room on the other side where you can just make like sounds um cool and we recorded audio but that that was really like an interactive um um workshop because it didn't just bring it wasn't just an introduction of what demon fm was it wasn't just a catch up it was also a thing where people actually did something and like learned something and i and i think like sometimes when you're having meetings like that they have to be strand specific like particularly with radio and you know that you couldn't i couldn't really see you integrating uh magazine into that for example no but th- yeah as i say I-, I think workshops are a completely different thing because i think you know they're not really a meeting they're more of a hands-on you like learning well, what to do for the strand sort well, of that's thing. That, that's what i mean though it's it's like um it it yeah you hands on but like before that you might meet in this room and chat about some of the updates yeah yeah i I get i get that um but you know i I wouldn't consider that as you know just like a sit down meeting where you know you're discussing what's going on in demon yeah it's more of a you know this is how you use the system sort of thing like yeah yeah, i feel a workshop is uh, very different to a meeting and i think meetings should aim to be more cross strand whereas workshops i agree with you are more specific yeah um i also but i also personally believe that um the running of the strand is up to the strand uh director the strand manager um yeah so that's that's why i didn't that's why i don't think i would have done the whole general meetings this year because um like a few of the strands weren't as keen on the idea few mm. were it um but then it's sort of because i feel like a lot of the groups were already so set and you know yeah you, you have to have each strand manager wanting to be in a group meeting rather than it being just one and me saying oh you're now doing group meetings you know i have to let them decide really yeah i mean my plan as chair for next year is really to be very as as involved as I can be with all three strands. Yeah. You know, whenever there's any sort of workshop or anything going on for magazine, TV, FM, I want to be present. I want to be there and I want to be involved. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I hear what you're saying where the strand leaders do ultimately have the control of their strand. Yeah. But I, I, I don't want to get into this mindset of oh, my strand is competing with the other strand. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's a careful balance, i found, like, because you don't want to be... As chairperson, you're, like, you're, like, the overseer of all of Demon Media. So I don't ever really want to go into Maddie's FM and mm. say, you should do it this way, this way, or this way. Because that's not... I don't really see that as my decision. I see it as she was appointed to run FM and... I was appointed to advise her about things. I see myself as more like an advisor, if anything. Yeah. But like as the overall vision for Demon Media, like I particularly wanted it to be more because then you have that overall vision. Like you want it to be more community driven. You, I wanted it to be. You know, I wanted. I did want more interaction with strands, but you have to do it with, you know, without saying to that strand, you've got to change the way you're running things, because it's not particularly my place to tell them to run it differently yeah i mean we'll just have to see how the um how the strand leaders run the strands next year and how the committee um gets on 
Yeah. Um, you know, we we don't know for sure how things are going to run next year, whether they will be, you know, three separate things um, or whether it will be fully connected. But I, I think in terms of, like, the update meetings, I think you could probably really, really pull off uh, group meetings for updates. You know, like, where you sit down and, you know, I reckon that could be all straight. I reckon that's easier. I actually think that's um, because then you don't have then then only one person has to book the room. Then you only have to make one presentation. You don't you know you don't have each strand manager has to make one presentation, and then you know then it can you can update it. It might make them meetings a bit longer. Uh, I I won't be too bothered about that. and then, but then you want to still. I think you still need to keep like the at least like the 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 producer sort of beatings of Demon FM, like because you know there'll be a lot of there'll be like there'll be people who do still cultivate to one strand or another. Yeah, but people are working course, all, yeah. um, and they, they would then people who are working on that strand like every day would need to have their own meetings. But that would be whatever the station manager sees fit. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, right, shall we go to a song break yeah. before we uh, discuss our other topics of conversation? So uh, we've had a request in from Liz, um, who we will be talking about shortly, and uh, what her plans are for the magazine. Oh, uh, but yeah, next up we have Does Your Mother Know by ABBA. It is very, very warm in the studio. Yeah. Um, I am thirsty. Um what about you, Tom? Am I? Uh, not really. Not. I'm not particularly thirsty. Could do as an all-day breakfast. Oh yeah. Who who doesn't want an all-day breakfast? Honestly, it's like the best time to eat a breakfast in the afternoon. It is. It, it's always. I might. I might grab. I might make one today. I have got some eggs. It's like cereal. Like cereal just hits different when you have it at two a.m. Okay, so here's the fun thing I think we could do. So you're you're bit you're making a bid to be chairperson, to be chairperson elect in a possibly a few weeks. I'm going to ask you. I'm I'm not going to have a conversation anymore, like because I we we've, we've done that. We've had a chat about Rundimia. I'm going to ask you just questions about what what you see, what you think the future's going to be like. Is this like a politician interview? Yeah, this is more like yeah. Okay. This imagine you're you're on the campaign trail, you know, you know, uh, Obama's just or Trump's just re- removed from office, and then now the new elections happening. Lord Jackson has been removed yeah. from office. Yeah, Lord Jackson's just been voted out. Um, he's no, resigning. He's, he's not been voted out. His, his terms yeah. have expired. His terms expired. He was, the, he was a highly popular figure. Was Lord yeah. Jackson? He, he and you know. You're bringing a new party on board. You know, we've got a new party coming. It's, it's, it's not a new party. Um, Lord Jackson was obviously the leader of the Mead and Cheese Party. Um, but, you know, the the chair of the society can only serve as many terms as their time at De Montfort University. And sadly for the Mead and Cheese Party, our lord and leader, Thomas Jackson, um has, his time at DMU will expire yeah. uh, soon. But, you know, I have been elected as the leader of the Mead and Cheese Party by the Mead and Cheese Party uh, paying members, um, all yeah. two of them. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to taking over where, where Lord Jackson uh, left off. So, OK, so first off, Sum up your vision in like a paragraph. What's your vision for Demon Media going forward? My my vision for Demon Media is for a society that is unified, uh, that works hard, but also has fun. Okay, okay, cool. Um, how are you... One thing that Demon FM did really well this year was it brought in more societies into the fold it's like community it, it, it brought in like it had like meetings of salsa it had loads of people on this radio show absolutely yes. how would and you that, continue to do that and make that better well obviously the this year's station manager maddie forster um was a big um driving force of that collaboration with societies 
with her radio show uh, Socials with Societies. Um, but, you know, I feel like um, as the chair, I will work with all of the Strand leaders. Um, I will work with Maddie to uh, continue to get Societies uh, involved and in collaborating with FM. Um, I know that Liz, who has run for the head of the magazine next year, she's put a lot of emphasis on collaborating with societies. Um, she wants to collaborate with the Creative Writing Society um, to get some creative writing sections in the Demon magazine. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, the Strand leaders um, will collaborate a lot with societies and I will uh, push for that and I will help them along with that. Why should... Um a fresher want why would why should a why would a fresher want to join Corey West Demon Media? Because Corey West Demon Media um is a demon media that is fun and inclusive for everyone involved. I, I don't I don't want to treat it like it's a bureaucracy, like you said. Yeah. I, I don't want to treat it like, you know, um you you're gonna come to Demon Media, you will do this, uh, and you will make it to this level of quality. Um, I don't want people to be annoyed by it or feel like, oh, no, I've got to go do my demon thing now. Um, I want people to think, oh, I'm excited to do, to do demon. I want to get involved with FM. I want to do my radio show. I want to, you know, record some videos for TV and upload it to the YouTube. You know, maybe write a fun article for the magazine. Um, th there's tons of stuff you could do with demon media, and I think... You know, there's something for everyone, whether you're a writer, whether you're a talker, or whether you want to operate a camera or be an editor. There's yeah. plenty to get involved with. Okay, so um, talk about bureaucracy. Lord Lord, Lord Thomas Jackson, chairperson of Demon Media, once said that bureaucracy was one of the, one of the big things he wanted to remove from Demon Media. Yeah. But he also stressed how hard it is to remove bureaucracy without being, you know, because you, you have to, he, he he said that you have to, um, you have to sort of walk a tightrope of not becoming bureauc bureaucratized yourself while remain, but also making sure the things happen in motion to remove bureaucracy. How would you, you know, ensure that bureaucracy doesn't rise in Demon Media? Well, you see, you you bring up a good point. Like, you you don't want to um, try and eliminate bureaucracy by turning Demon Media into a dictatorship. Yeah. You don't want to just rule with an iron fist. Um, and as you said earlier, your position was more of an advisory role to the Strand leaders um, than someone who went to the Strand leaders and said, you must do this in this way. Okay. Um, so... You know, I, I will I will push for, for strand leaders to collaborate with each other and for the strands to work together. Um but but as you say, the, the strands are in the control of the strand leaders and um unless the members of the strands um go against them, there's not really much I can do if uh, they wanna do something entirely different to what my vision is. How would you then motivate st strand managers to um take on you know you know like the, the the problem is you get let's say you get halfway through the year people start to lose motivation you know mm -hmm. a lot of projects start to fall behind how do you keep your committee motivated on you know the goal for demon media the vision well i, I think by making it fun uh, you know, if if demon media is fun, yeah. people won't lose interest. Um, yeah, I I know that in years prior, I've done a radio show before where, you know, I I got bored of it. I thought, oh, this radio show is is boring. I don't enjoy doing it. Um, you know, and that was, you know, you could say that Demon FM was more bureaucratic yeah. back then. Um, but you know, this year, uh, Maddie you know, took charge of FM. Um, she made it a lot more fun, a lot less corporate. Um, and, you know, we got to do a show like Mead and Cheese, which yeah. I don't think would have been as possible in years prior. Yeah, I don't think it would have been possible either. But, um... And, you know, I want to I give people opportunities to 
use demon media for whatever they want to use it for as a platform for them to start new things like mead and cheese you know like if they want to experiment with uh, youtube videos they could do that on tv if they want to just write some articles for the magazine they they have that opportunity okay so next question that's a very good answer um so so like there's a lot of like philosophical changes but there's also practical changes yeah um what sort of like big changes are you thinking of making either philosophy wise or practical so a big practical change and i believe i wrote it in my manifesto is um having monthly meetings that are cross strand okay so you know every month there will be a meeting with all three strands present that i will organize um just so you know maybe you do join demon media and and you know you talking to jack and uh you're getting involved with tv but you've not really you know gotten involved much with uh maddie in fm or or liz in the magazine and you you don't know what what they they're up to um having these cross strand meetings is a good way of getting that tv guy uh to to find out what fm and magazine can offer um so i think you know the the cross strand monthly meetings is a big thing that I will push for. Nice, nice. Uh, any other like big or little changes you want to make to how things are run? Um, I think I think um, I want to put more emphasis on the legacy of Demon Media. Um, what you do know. you mean by legacy? Well, Demon FM has been running since 1995, um, and you know demon tv has been producing content on their youtube channel for for quite a few years as well and the magazine has been running for for many years and i, I think it'd be nice to you know uh, keep an eye out for anniversaries i think it'd be nice to look at some of our legacy content yeah um and you know maybe even continue that i know we were looking through um demon tv's library uh, recently and um we reached out to uh, to David, who um, former uh, um, FM station manager, for, former FM station manager David, um, who created a series on Demon TV quite a few years ago called uh, the Benches of DMU, and uh, we reached out to him and asked for his blessing to continue the series and make a, a second season, and he he was uh, very happy that we wanted to do that and I think you know looking back at the legacy content on TV but also looking back at older articles written for the magazine and you know some of the stuff on FM it'd be nice to um, sort of call back to that and just show that the legacy is there nice nice um, yeah obviously the legacy important it, it, this strand um, has been going on for 25 years as like you know, there's all sorts we do. We do rag every year. We do the award ceremony every year. Um, but so, so all these traditions have been started, and a lot of them should uh, keep going on. But is there any new traditions you want to bring to Demon Media? Um, I don't know if I've got any like set in stone plans for yeah new traditions. Uh, I think. Obviously, making it more interconnected so that, you know, just emphasize yeah. you are paying for a membership for the whole of Demon Media. And um, I, I yeah. want Demon Media to feel more like one entity as opposed to three separate entities. Um, that's the main thing. One thing I want to bring back is the Christmas dinner. I, wa I wanted yeah. to bring back, but I wasn't a chairperson in time i was elected just in january so but like we missed we didn't do the christmas dinner this year um it didn't happen and that's something i thought was sad because it is like you know a cool one i I'd, i would love to see the return of that under your uh tenor tenger i i would love to do a christmas dinner um i would also love to bring back the demon media awards yeah. Um, and I think we have been discussing potentially bringing that back this year. In if, RAG, um, yeah, the yeah. live stream. See, look at how that works. I, I also think uh, we should have, like, a sort of, not so much of a war term, maybe, just, just a, like, because we didn't do a Christmas dinner this year, I'm considering should we do some sort of, 
I don't know, summer dinner this year. Maybe. Picnic. A Hugo sandwich yeah, picnic. Yeah, a, a, a demon mead yeah, picnic. Yeah, yeah. And like, it didn't have to be anything. I'm not saying it has to be anything official. I just thought it might be, you know, a nice idea. No, and you talk about starting new traditions as well, actually. And um, there is one idea that I had yeah. um, that I've, I've just remembered. Um, so obviously we have uh, a lot of socials. A demon media and socials are a great way of keeping the society uh, connected yeah uh, across all strands um but i also uh, want to start a new a new thing um as well as the socials uh, called a mead merriment where uh demon media members can meet up um and and enjoy a bottle of mead uh well you know maybe we get someone playing the loot um and we you know stand around a fire um, and uh, it could be very, very nice. I think maybe we could even do it in collaboration with the uh, medieval reenactment society. Maybe that sounds cool. Um, just a few more questions for you, Corey. Uh, no, number one. Oh, it's not the first question we said, but uh, what? So, what? Any new positions you want to bring onto the committee? Obviously, this year, um, I made I remade a. Uh, position of vice chair um as as one to people to do and you 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 applied and won for that one is there any other positions you would like to see which could make the committee stronger yes i'm i'm hesitant to um invent new positions yeah um but you know the vice chairship if the if there is someone who who um approaches me about it and you know, says, oh, I'd like to help out more and help you with your tasks and stuff. Maybe I could open the position for people to run. Um, maybe even have a vice-vice chair to yeah. help them. Yeah, because we... And, that, that's and one a vice-vice-vice chair yeah. to help them. I think one of my greatest achievements this year was having a vice-vice chair person. Hugo, Hugo. Sandwich. Yeah. yeah. And I think... I think... I think that that's a great idea. I think continue that. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think we'll see. We'll see what the situation is. If we feel like we need new positions, we'll make them. But if if we don't feel that we need new positions, we'll uh, continue with the committee as yeah. is. Because sometimes it is good to keep a committee small. You know, having a big committee can be, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen sort of situation. Yes, exactly. And um, if we want to keep this um, this vision of demon media as one entity um so maybe having more people could strengthen that but then having more people could also sort of break it off into factions yeah. and people could form their own groups within the committee and we might be more likely to uh, lose that vision yeah yeah it i feel like it's something you have to play month by month as you're in charge like um I, I I slowly changed the way committee meetings were happening. I made them less frequent and more focused. Mm -hmm. We made I added a few people in, um, but it, it's sort of like you have to experiment with the best way of um, ruling what works for you and your committee. I think the the only worry I have for the committee at the moment is that we haven't had anyone run for secretary. Ah yes. Yeah. So if you're out there listening. Uh, you may be able to go in a by-election and run for secretary. Um, that will probably happen. I, I can't. I don't know when they do the by-elections, but it will come probably after up. the elections. Finish, yeah, yeah, yeah. It won't be now. It won't be now. Uh, the the main issue with that is, you know, I'm I'm not like totally set that. Oh, we definitely need a secretary or anything. I'm not saying it's, you know, something. I'm. Oh, we need a secretary to do this and that. Yeah, but. The DSU say we need a secretary. Yeah, it's one of them ones where it's you have to, it's part of the core four. I think it is the core four. So if if you if you're not aware to run a student group at De Montfort University, uh, you register your society with the students' union, mm -hmm. um, and the students' union um, say that you must have four core roles on the committee, which is your chairman, your treasurer your health and safety officer and your secretary. Mm -hmm. And if all four of those positions aren't filled, 
the society or student group can't run. Which is sad. And I would hate for Demon Media to cease to exist purely because we didn't get a secretary. Yeah, yeah, I I see what you're saying, uh, but I I think there's going to be I think I could think of people now who I would think would be great on the committee. There's a load of people I would want to, you know, encourage to run, um, and it's just about having them conversations with them people. I agree. Yeah, obviously, um, we have a lot of a lot of two horse races in the election. We have um, both uh, Evan and uh, Emily. Yeah, running for treasurer, and we have um, and we have Kieran and Maddie running for yeah uh, FM station manager, yeah. and you know maybe if um, you know if someone loses their uh, two horse race, yeah, as we say, and they do definitely want to be on the committee, maybe that person could put themselves forward to be secretary. Yeah, and um, remember, like in this election, it's not just the secretary. Uh, there's going to be each one of these stage managers will pick deputies. There'll be, there'll be a deputy of Demon FM. Um, there'll be a deputy of Demon TV, and there'll be a deputy editor of um, Demon Magazine. So there'll be three deputy positions. Yeah, and there may uh, even potentially be a vice chair. Yeah, there'll be a vice chair. Pro- probably you. I think. I think vice vice chair might even now be part of the core four um <laughs> <laughs> no it's, it's really not <laughs> um but yeah and then after that like each strand leader will pick their sort of uh separate team they'll have producers on their yeah. team and that will be it and normally like i think because memberships what about 50 members maybe a few maybe more give or take you know you can get quite a lot of this, the, the membership into positions of actual, you know, positions of power of in the strands. I agree. Um, yeah. I think after five o'clock, starting from five o'clock, we will start the um, film industry hour. Yeah, that sounds good. And uh, we will discuss, um, what was it you wanted to discuss, Tom? The life of cinemas? Yeah, I was just sort of thinking like cinema distribution, you know, some of the things. You work at Showcase, we could talk about that. Um, we could talk about, see where that leads, talk about some of the things about the media industry. We could, yeah, I agree. So, um, yeah, while we uh, have a quick technical thing to sort out, next up is The Kings by Run DMC. This is your student sound. Demon FM. Welcome back to Late Nights with Leroy. Late Nights. Or should I say Late Nights with Mead and Cheese. Late Nights with Mead and Cheese. It sounds good. I like that. So before we go into our film industry hour, I wanted to see how lucky Mead and Cheese is as a show. So I've got a National Lottery Special Edition scratch card and I'm going to scratch it off live on air, yeah, and we will see if Mead and Cheese is lucky enough to win two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Okay. I have won two pounds. How much did it cost you? Two pounds. Work done. School's out. It's time for home run. I love it when they play my tunes. My tunes. My My tunes. tunes. The hot hits. And the throwback anthems. The home run on Demon FM. The soundtrack to your journey home until 6pm. It isn't time for the home run. Yes, game one. I have won two pounds. Do you think I'll win anything on the other games, Tom? I hope so. I'm not sure if you will or not, but I hope so. Let's see. I haven't won anything on game two. Let's see about game three. So I need to match three of these things. Uh, no. No, I've not won anything on game three either. The bonus game? No. So, I have won two pounds 
on the lottery scratch card that cost me two pounds. So overall, I've made a profit of zero pounds. So will you go buy another one with that, or will you just like leave it as a you know a sign that it's a weak one? I um I might go get another one um after a while. I don't know. Yeah, maybe for next week's meat and cheese. Maybe. Maybe. So it is past five o'clock and we are going to discuss the film industry aren't we tom we are yes we are we are going to be discussing that today um so shall we just get into it i think i think we should give some context first so this is a trial run for yeah. your new upcoming podcast is that yeah. correct this is this is a trial run for my new upcoming podcast. Basically, a little bit of contents here. Um, we are, me and Corey, are both very, very big on the industry. We are both always interacting with the media industry. I personally am do a lot of videography work. I do it for brands. I do it for on film commercials. Corey is a great actor. He worked on a film the other day um, where he played a character of a murderer. In it, it was quite an interesting film. I watched. I actually was honoured to actually watch one of the test screenings of that. But yeah, and he's also obviously the vice chair of Demon Media. You know, yep. we're very, we're quite, we're quite big industry professionals here. So what I thought is we could every week um, have a podcast where we talk about not just the creative side of media, but also the more like business orientated thing as well, um, because. Yeah. I just thought it'd be an interesting thing to do, and um, we'll bring on guests uh, every week to also discuss like their experience in the industry and just see where these sort of interesting conversations lead to. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a great idea for a podcast, and obviously with you being such um, an expert in the field, um, I think it's uh, going to be great for people to listen in and get some insight. And you know, you can even learn yourself from some of the guests that you get. Exactly, exactly. I feel like it's one of them ones where I don't want to keep it like, I want to sort of have like a subject for the episode, but like, you know, it's a conversation. And I think like, because it's a conversation, you, know, you sort of learn things from each other. So um, well, I was thinking about doing this one, starting this off, this one with just about the future of cinema distribution. Mm-hmm. Um Obviously, yesterday, ne- well, it was a few days ago now, Netflix had a lot of subscribers um, cancel their subscriptions to yeah. um, Netflix. Um, I think that's to do with the cost of living. Um, but also, you know, a lot of people, there's been a big debate where people say, is cinema going, you know, dead? Is it? Mm-hmm. Has COVID stomped it out? I personally don't believe that, but I, I get the argument. So um, I just want to sort of discuss sort of like um, distribution with you as you um, actually work for Showcase. Yeah, um, going back to the Netflix uh, discussion, I would like to say obviously the cost of living crisis in this country um, has had an impact on the um, large exodus of subscribers. Um <laughs> But as a worldwide issue, I mainly think that Netflix is losing subscribers due to competition. Yeah. Um, You know, the emergence of Disney Plus, uh, Prime Video, um, and in the States as well, they've got way more streaming services. They've got Peacock, they've got HBO Max, they've got uh, Hulu, um, you know, they've got all... All of these new streaming services and uh, Netflix is just sort of falling to the wayside. Yeah, I suppose. um, Yeah, I suppose. um, It's an interesting one because Netflix, when it came out, it was quite... Originally, it was a DVD rental service. They'll post DVDs. Mm -hmm to your door and that was revolutionary at the time but like it's become netflix was the one you know you'd have netflix and you'd have everything but now like you have to have prime netflix and disney Plus. that's three different subscriptions you have to pay for to get like a good variety of content 
here, here's the thing as well with uh, Netflix. Obviously, you talk about how Netflix used to be this gold standard for a streaming service. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously, Netflix, it used to be that you would just have a Netflix subscription and you could find almost everything you wanted on it. Like, you know, Disney was on Netflix, mm-hmm. Warner Bros. were on Netflix. Like Paramount, anything you wanted to watch was on Netflix, and now they all want their own, don't and they? And now they're all, they're all starting their own streaming yeah. services, yeah, yeah. Which is um, and then again, it's like so Netflix dropped piracy, but now with all the all these different services, mm-hmm. piracy will be up. But piracy is not actually a bad thing. Like obviously, like yeah, it's not it's illegal to pirate um things it's not i wouldn't recommend doing it but piracy when there's piracy is high of like video content like netflix series is films particularly films cinema it, it doesn't stop people from going to cinema if piracy is high cinema going is also high i don't i don't know if i necessarily agree with that i i know people who and again, this goes back to the cost of living crisis. Who you know, they they haven't gone to a cinema in a while. And yeah, they um, you know they probably won't go to a cinema because cinemas are getting ex- more and more expensive. And you know, if they can just pirate a movie, even if it is just you know some guy with yeah. his camera um, <laughs> filming it, um, you know that's free and that, that um, allows them to see all the films they want. So so the. The result of a study, though, was that even if pi- the higher, like across the board, across the board, the more the more something's pirated, like say a film, mm-hmm. the more money it will make in cinema because um, it means that people are enjoying the film. Like if people are pirated, that they want the content, and there's a separation between home viewing and cinema viewing, which you haven't really got at home yet it's like it's the actual experience of going to a cinema yeah it's like it's a it's a day out well an evening out it's a date it's a it's um it's like special like you go out you you get popcorn you you know you might plan a meal before or after it, it, it is a activity rather than just downloading a movie or going on netflix and watching mm-hmm. it no i get that 100 percent. i i love the cinema experience yeah um, which is why i applied for a job at the cinema yeah and, and you know i'm i'm happy to work at the cinema uh one of the best parts of my job is you know when there is that big film coming out like um like when spider-man came out yeah. and there was this huge uh, buzz about it i could talk to to the customers where before they were going to go into the screen, I could say, oh, what are you watching? They'd say, oh, I'm here to watch Spider-Man. i say, oh, are you excited for it? They'd say, yeah, I'm really excited. We'd have a nice chat about the film that they're going to see. You know, it, it's nice to see people excited to see films. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, those chats. You get, like, a real sort of sense of community. Right? Like I go with, like, sometimes I go just with my, my partner, Maddie. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we go with... Um, our friends and it's like a little event and sometimes it's like some like sometimes these are friends i see all the time but sometimes they're not sometimes they're friends i would only see every so often so it's like an excuse to get together which you don't necessarily have if i just invited them to come around and watch netflix it's like you know we might go for a few pints and then we'll go watch the film then we'll go maybe for like lunch or something i don't know but like i i i personally and I personally love going to the cinema. I I would pay more to go to cinema. Like I find it quite cheap at the minute. I, I don't know about it being cheap. I mean, I I'm in a very privileged position where you know I as because I work for the cinema, yeah. I haven't paid to go see a film in a, a while because I get free yeah. cinema tickets with my job. Yep, which is a massive plus. Yeah. Let's be honest, like, you know, if you can go see a film that you want to see for free in the cinema, that's that's one that, of the best reasons to work yeah. for the cinema, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose, like, when I say, like, I've got an insider card, so that makes things cheaper, but you can also pick the days you go. Like, the day can affect the price, you know, you can... 
sometimes you can get like deals and that and i'm a bit frugal like that but um a question then for you as you're um you work for showcase you know you're obviously an expert in this sort of industry um do you where do you see sort of showcase going like what what improvements could showcase make to make it make bring more people in really well one massive improvement i think that they could make and it'd be a very easy thing for them to implement would be to uh, get mead behind the bar yeah in yeah the director's you, lounge because you've, you've 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 had a you've had a lot of people come in and talk actually ask you for that product in um cinema i have yeah um obviously my main position yeah. is working behind the bar yeah at the cinema and, and recommending improvements right <laughs> and um I, i'll often get get people come in and ask if we've got mead and uh say oh you know you should really get mead in and uh, you'll get loads of people coming in and yeah so what is the link between wanting to go to the cinema and mead well, it, it's just combining two great things, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's you know, if you if you go to the cinema and you um, go get a drink at the bar, which by the way, at Showcase Cinema, if you go to the bar, you can get a drink to take into the screen with you. Um, you know, if you could buy a bottle of mead, you know, put that in your bag and take that into the screen. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. I think people would be a hundred percent behind drinking mead while they're watching a film. I mean, perfect opportunity would have been to do it for the Northman, uh, the the Viking movie that's out now. Yeah, yeah, no, they, I, I'm not personally heard of that one, but I think that any sort of like to bring it out, don't just bring it out like obviously if it's gonna if a lot of people are demanding it, bring it out at a good time, like bring it out as a like a limited edition special probably first. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, but I mean, the main problem we've got at the minute with the cinema, and I do think it links to the cost of living crisis, is we, we, we're not very busy very often. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're very lucky if we, if we sell a lot of tickets for a particular screen. Um, and I do think it's the cost of living crisis, but I also think it's because, um, you know, a lot of cinema goers just aren't that interested in a lot of the films releasing nowadays as well yeah you don't think they're as quality as they could be um because what what i will say is um obviously spider-man was a huge release yeah and when spider-man came out i think that's the busiest i've, I've seen it in my time working there um and I, I i do think that marvel movies as much as some people will say that they're killing cinema and things like that i, I actually think that the massive success and popularity of marvel movies is uh one of the few things that's keeping cinemas going yeah yeah i suppose like there's been a few times where i've gone to the cinema and i thought like this is a great movie and there's not been many people in there yeah which in one way you like because it's like you know you got the cinema to yourself but then in another way you sort of lose that I don't know, like, you know, when, like, uh, Avengers Endgame came out and it was ramp pack with people, and it's, like, kind of cool that, you know, it's, like, you're part of that hype, but when mm. some films come out and there's not got that sort of amount of people, and it sometimes can be quite sad. Obviously, the new Spider-Man was uh, the most recent example of that, because um, yeah. I, I know I went to see it on opening day at the Odeon, and... Um, the the screen was rammed and people were cheering and uh, it was it was beautiful to experience yeah. and, and even weeks later um at showcase we were still like selling a lot of tickets for the screens and people were still really excited to see the film yeah yeah it's um it's definitely interesting isn't it? it's what's happening but you know um since then i mean batman did did okay um the first week it was busy but then after that it kind of dropped off um but the pre-sales are looking really good for doctor strange 2 yeah um again an upcoming marvel release so we're thinking that should be uh, a busy period yeah and so in terms of like so we was talking about last night um about starting independent cinemas do you think there's much profit in that anymore 
It depends on the experience you offer, on the market that you're aiming it towards, and uh, how much you price it at. Uh, because, you know, I, I was talking about opening a cinema in Sutton in Ashfield. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, the only cinema near there is the Odeon in Mansfield. Yeah. And as we were discussing, it is the most expensive cinema um, in the UK outside of London. Yeah. Um, and that is purely because there is no competition around it for miles. And the, and so what you want to do is open a competitor cinema. I want to open a cinema for the people in that area, uh, in the Mansfield yeah. urban area. Um, so, so how do you even start like a project like that, like getting a cinema? How would you even start that? I, I don't know. I, I imagine you'd need a license. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose you have to look at buildings as well, where to have them. Yes, that's another thing, getting the venue. There, there was a cinema in Sutton and Ashfield yeah. many years ago, but it is now a Weatherspoons. Ah, yeah, okay. Was that, I don't know, was that sort of like, um, is that sort of like where this started then, um, when you saw that Weatherspoons? Um, yeah, I mean, this, this Weatherspoons, it's like, it's been converted from a really old-fashioned, like, small cinema that had one screen yeah um but i i like that vibe you yeah. know like when i went to the isle of man on holiday uh they've only got two cinemas on the island and uh me and my partner liz we went to this uh little cinema called uh palace cinema and uh it was a it was a tiny little cinema and it you know how old cinemas look like the, the white buildings with like the art deco style um you know i, I could probably get a picture but it wouldn't be great for the audio format yeah uh but you know it was like it's like this old building it it looked really nice you, you go in to like this small little screen and there's a curtain over the screen um like red fabric and that opens before the film starts and it the vibe of the place it was like uh you'd walked into a time machine and it was kind of cool um, but then you'd gone back to the present when the, the Suicide Squad started playing, <laughs> I suppose. But yeah, I would be happy with just having like, you know, a, just a small cinema. Because, um, yeah. uh, you know, if people want that big cinema experience, they'll, they'll go to the Odeon. But, they, you know, I, 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 my idea would be to provide a cheap alternative to the yeah. Odeon. Would you want it to be cheap? I would, yeah. Uh, my my mission would be to keep costs low for the customer. Would you would you then subsidise that? Obviously, keeping costs low means you make less profits. Would you have any services in that cinema, like I don't know, arcade machines, um, popcorn, meals, maybe meals, restaurant? You know, would you have anything like that to sort of like maybe prop up the losses from the pay per view? Um, abs absolutely. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know me, I'm a huge retro gaming fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have a huge collection of uh, retro games consoles. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, I have a lot of things in my head that I think, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I opened a cinema? Wouldn't yeah. it be cool if I opened an arcade? Yeah. And, you know, one idea I did have for a while... Uh, was oh it'd be nice to open you know like a retro arcade in in Sutton in Ashfield and uh, I don't know so if you, you if Sutton in Ashfield is like the right market for that but yeah. I, I like the idea of having this old style arcade that people can walk into and you know play Pac Man and and Dig Dug and Donkey Kong and you know all these old games. Um, but yeah, combining the two, having a cinema and an arcade, yeah, I think that's a perfect combination. Yeah, and so what would you call it? What 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 are you going to call this cinema? What you're making? Sundial Cinema. Sundial Cinema. So yeah, I suppose like I'm really excited to see this place built. When do you think um, you're going to start? Like, where, where sort of are you in your current like roadmap to on this? It well, at the moment, it's just an idea. An idea. But yeah, but I suppose you're like, you know, you've been looking at places, you know, like I, I, you know, are you sort of like looking at the market at the minute? Well, this, this was originally something that I um, discussed with my dad. Yeah. About starting uh, because he, he really likes the idea of 
opening a cinema as yeah. well. And, you know, we, we have a lot of hometown pride. We want to see uh, more things in our hometown. Um, and, you know, a cinema is one of those things that I, th- I feel like a town needs. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Just because it, it adds to the culture adds, of the town. It, and particularly if you... It builds a filmmaking community in that area. If, you, if you're... Because, like, it's, hmm. you, I don't... I know you work at Showcase, but I don't know how you'd go about getting a film in Showcase. But, like, the Phoenix Cinema in Leicester, they, like, play films from student films, local made films. You know, it's great for the locals. It gives a bit of... Yeah, it does give that sense of pride. I do agree. That's that's exactly a great point as well. Yeah. Uh, with those... If it did open, uh, we would obviously be an independent cinema. And, yeah. as you said, with that, we have more freedom for what we can show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we could show uh, locally made films. We yeah. could, you know, get local filmmakers from around the Nottinghamshire area um, and show their films in the Sundial Cinema. So, um, when you when when you open this, um, what what sort of like look are you going to go for in the venue? Have you any thoughts about what your materials you're going to be using? Like? I, I would want to go for the retro aesthetic. Le- t- completely retro. I I would want it to feel like you've walked into a time machine like yeah you know i don't want it to be ultra modern because yeah. that's not really my style yeah I, I want i want you to see this building i want it to look old but i don't want it to look run down you know i want yeah. it to look you know in good condition but with that old aesthetic and you walk in and uh, it's a nice carpeted floor and uh, you've got like arcade machines over there, um, and yeah, the I th- I think it's a it's a fun yeah. idea. Yeah, uh, maybe we'd have like a recreation uh, of the sundial. Are you looking somewhere. for like? Are you at the stage where you're looking for like other investors to come on board as partners on this? Or are you just taking this on a solo project? Would you want to invest? I mean, I I mean, I'd definitely consider it. I'd definitely consider it. Yeah, I think I would. Yeah. Yeah, I I'd be up for having you as a partner for setting up Sundial Cinemas. Yeah, uh, maybe you know it could become a chain at some point. Yeah, I think successful. so. I I definitely think so. I think like for me personally, I would like a cinema with marble in it. I'd have to have some somewhere with marble in it. Yeah, I think marble could work. Like in the seating area. Like I know you get most cinemas now have black seats, but I want that sort of red sort of. You know, red fabric. I'm, I'm thinking like red velvet. Yeah. But I'm like, thinking like... It, it needs to look classy, yeah, I think. Instead of having like your XL lap, once you have that like, have like marble seating area. Like, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know if it'll look all right or not, but I thought marble sort of seats would, would be like, like, not like actual marble seats, but like, you know, decorated with marble around them. I, I know what you mean. Like yeah. for the... Um, for like the arms uh, yeah. with the the drinks holders and yeah, stuff like, like that, it could yeah. be marble. Yeah, it, it's it, we're we're talking about opening. You know, we talk about the retro aesthetic. We're talking about opening a very elegant cinema. Yeah, with you know marble and yeah, uh, velvet and everything. It's um and it's a luxury experience. Would would you consider bringing back things like double features, like where you buy one, like they did in the old days? You you buy a ticket what's two films rather than one absolutely this is something i've um i've discussed with some of my friends back home in sutton yeah about this and uh, they're on board with the idea as well and i think they would also be interested in helping starting this up yeah um and i said so you, you got know, a, you got a big team now then yeah and you know i said wouldn't it be cool if uh you know we we did double features like you say or we did like marathon features yeah like you know people love a marathon nowadays yeah. we're in we're in um what's it called binge watching culture now yeah 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 and you know i could see um a cinema doing well that sells one ticket for a star wars movie marathon or a marvel movie marathon or something like that maybe yeah. not all in one go Mate, I think so. I think like it's a challenge, isn't it? And people love challenges. And if you say like, "This is your day," you know, you're gonna get here. At, I don't know. You don't want to get there at nine, but let's say they get there at, like twelve. 
you know, have lunch. Then they have like a Star Wars themed lunch and make it like, you know, they have breaks so you can go and like play Star Wars games, you know, like in the arcade. Yeah, yeah. Have stormtroopers, everyone's in Star Wars. Yeah, you get make, the whole staff dressed as stormtroopers. Make it cool. like really festival, make festivalized. You yeah. Know, make it cool. And um, that would attract people from like around the country as well, not yeah. just from the Ashfield area. Yeah. Yeah, to the Sundial, yeah. Cuz cuz you know, if if you're like East Midlands based, yeah. You know, and you hear oh up in Nottinghamshire they're doing this uh, big Star Wars movie marathon at a cinema and all the staff are dressed in stormtroopers you'll go. You'll go. and stuff. You'd say, you know, especially if you're a big Star Wars fan, you'd be like, "Oh, I'll go out my way to go see that." Yeah. Yeah, and you could also sell like I mean, like, I think one thing what cinemas don't do, which I think they probably should do, which I don't know if you considered this with your um, team yet, is like, so you'll, you'll, even, even like just for the Star Wars, like a new Star Wars film coming out, the premieres, they should have a toy shop as they come out, you know, where you can get mementos about the films you just watched. Like, I won't work for all films, but like for Star Wars, it certainly would. I think a toy shop would work very well. It's not something I'd really thought about, but I yeah. suppose, you know, if you put the toy like shop area right between the arcade and the cinema section, yeah, that's like the perfect place to put yeah, it. Yeah, and like if you if you're a kid watching Star Wars, you're gonna want to watch like, have a little Manelum Falcon or some Star Stormtroopers. Yeah, yeah. I I think like we just commercialise if you just commercialise it a bit more you wouldn't actually need to charge very high ticket prices yeah you could, you could go a lot lower than the competition but you'd actually make the actual say say like okay I go to like a cinema and I pay £7 to let's say I pay like £8 to go in and I just watch the film but I bring my own popcorn I bring my own this and that I've only spent £8 but if someone comes to our cinema Oh, they have lunch there. They have they spend ten pounds on lunch. Yeah, they pay you know five pounds on the ticket, and they go out and they they buy their kid a ten pound toy. You know, you've made like an, an extra twenty quid. Yeah, on top of what somewhere like showcase would make because we have more better services. So, like, I think that's something you definitely should discuss with your um, franchising team. I mean, yeah, I I think it's um, a good idea, and I think people are willing to come to the cinema and, you know, pay pay competitive prices because because yeah. the main thing you've got to think about is what your local competition is, yeah. and uh, in that area it would be the Odeon in Mansfield, yeah, which as we have said is the most expensive cinema outside of London. So as long as you are charging cheaper than what they're charging. You know, people will be on board, and it could still be like high prices for somewhere like Leicester, for example, where cinema prices are generally cheaper than they are up yeah. in Mansfield. Yeah, yeah, it, it's one of these things. It's if you make if you sell a premium service, people pay, and 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 if it is, it's a, if it's a true premium, you know, like mm -hmm. are you gonna like? People like would be going out, and they'd be so like like you know people will be wanting to go on dates there. It'll be the hot place to take someone on a date, hot place to take the kids. It would be an impressive place. I think you've really got something here with this cinema, the the Sundial Cinema. I think like, I'm really excited to see this place built, and I think that's also going to be maybe there's someone, maybe if there's any filmmakers out here listening, they should make a documentary about Lord Corey West building this cinema. Um, is there anything like? you want to say like is there any like open day you want to promote or anything well as as i said it is just an idea at the yeah moment. but this idea is sort of like on the rails on the on the on the tracks at the minute it's it it's going in it that that's that, that's the thing i don't even know where to start to yeah, try and you, open a cinema you just start on page one don't you that's how that's how like mead and cheese start you don't know where to start but you you go in and you just you know you put you put the coal in the train and these things just take off and mm. you know you one second you're sort of talking about it with your mate in a radio station or pocket the next second you're selling the lease to buy the building <laughs> then you got to just you you sort of hiring your first employee then you're hiring your, your hundredth employee it all happens all at once man ideally ideally 
we would uh, buy the um, old cinema building back off of Weatherspoons. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be ideal. E- even though it is very small, maybe we'd have to you know get some renovations. Build it, it, yeah. I think I could put you in contact with some building companies as well if you need. But I, I even like this idea of just you know the one screen cinema like the vibe yeah. because you know if you go to see a film in that cinema and it's only got the one screen every film we show is an event yeah 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 that is true i i do think you have to then subside that with like all the user all the other stuff yeah, yeah the arcade yeah and ev- things like, like that everything but yeah it might it makes cost of running it probably a bit lower as well with just the one screen yeah, yeah. less electricity yeah, that's true. Um, less staff. So here's... Is there any of the last thoughts you have about cinema industry? Well, I, I, I am just thinking off the top of my head, if we did get the Weatherspoons building, obviously we could uh, have a bar yeah. before people go into the one screen as well. It could it could just be like, you know, the director's lounge at sh- Showcase? Yeah. How, you know, you walk into the bar, it's all very yeah. fancy, and then you go into the screen and watch the film yeah it's just that but that that is the whole cinema yeah that makes but obviously sense. they've got an arcade uh, on the side as yeah. well premium premium i like it i like it i think you can do very well with this idea i think you're gonna i think i i, I think you're gonna um make a lot of money and i think to all my listeners keep an eye out on Corey. let's see when he um i think he's I'd say ideas often turn into reality. That's the nature of ideas. So keep an eye out and see what what happens here. Well, that's true because mead and cheese started off as just us spitballing ideas. Yeah, exactly. And who knows? Like this cinema, I I I don't think I think it could be. You know, maybe next year you could be seeing seeing the building of this cinema. Maybe maybe a twenty twenty three. Possibly after twenty twenty three. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe 2024. I don't know, you know. But I think when these things start, they start fast. So I, I would recommend you'll go follow Mead and Cheese on Instagram. And I'm sure Corey will keep that up to date. And also follow Corey on Instagram. Maybe what I'd do is talk to some of the managers at Showcase and say, hey, you know, if you uh, joined me and we started our yeah. own cinema... The uh, the amount of money that you could make would be a lot higher than what you're making now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get them to sort of um, come on board with you yeah. an independent brand. Exactly, exactly. Or, or you know, we just need to f- make a friend who's really rich who can back us financially. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, honestly, Corey, the sky's the limit. Um, talking about the sky and the limit. Um, this is not exactly the film industry, but I had um I was I was debating the other day with um one of my someone I know about why the United Kingdom doesn't have its own space program and why it'd be such a good idea. Is that really what we want to be talking about during the film hour? <laughs> yeah, just just a little five minute chat. You know, we have got plenty of time to burn through. I just thought because it's on my mind, it's going to be on my mind. Um, for a while and it's it can be to do with film rockets in it um yeah it's like i was thinking that we should build a space center i like expect the elon musk has some great things with spacex why don't we take uh make a space center and launch rockets from wales as a private company um, I think because a space program is very expensive. I know, but we are in a cost of living crisis. I know, but money is no object. It's like you know, once you get, once you put something in the idea train, it, it just goes, and the money will come and follow these ideas. Because, like, how cool would you think it would be if you could go to Wales, you go to Snowdonia, and then you go up north into Wales? I don't know, maybe somewhere near uh, Salamonic or Plaheiden. Um, you go somewhere around there. And you go and see a rocket take off, and it's called a dragon. It's called, and it has like the world flag on it. And, and you know, we're seeing British astronauts go to space. Forget putting like the Welsh flag on it. Make it in the shape of the dragon. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, you could do that. That'll be that'll probably make it more expensive. But <laughs> you know, 
I think it'll be worth it. I think having a space program of this country, generally, I think is a great idea. I think what we need to do is um, get get in contact with the government of the Isle of Man. Yeah. And uh, do our space program there. Ah, oh, I want to do it in Wales though. Why Isle of Man? Uh, because you know they they have a lot of money. They're um, they don't. <laughs> yeah, they do. Do they? Yeah, they're uh, they're a tax haven. They're full of like rich people. Oh, okay. Um, so you know, but build it there because you know they've got plenty of money to burn. Yeah. Um, and yeah, or 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 you could build it um in Gibraltar, or or on the Falklands. Uh, build it anywhere. But, and it's sort of that whole thing, like, build it and, and people come, you know, it'll make jobs. Uh, Are you thinking of it as more of, like, a tourism thing as well, then? Yeah, like, it's, it's like, you know, you'd have this in Wales or wherever, you could build a couple of space centres. I don't see why, you know, why you just limit yourself, one build, one in Leicester, you know. Snowden, we have a problem. Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it, it becomes something... I could see it as a solution to bring a lot of industry to the north of Wales, particularly. A lot of jobs, a lot of, like, you know, tourism. I think it would be a very good economic decision. Bringing it back to the film industry, then. Yeah. Would you do a commercial rocket flight that shows Star Wars on it? Or shows yeah. films? Yeah, I mean, that probably, that's probably more sort of your department because you're the one who's going to make a cinema. So if you're, <laughs> if if you as a as a business entrepreneur, if you're as an entrepreneur, would you consider actually doing that? Uh, you know, well, that's it. That's and the how Sundar would you do cinemas, that? Sundar Cinemas, as a as a big corporation, once we are, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world, we will launch the Sundar Shuttle. Yeah. which uh, shows uh, Sundial Film Studios uh, yeah. productions um, in, a, in a Sundial cinema screen on the Sundial shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, should we go for a little song break and then we'll think have some other topics to talk about about the industry? Yeah, let's do that because I really need the toilet. So um yeah let's let's play a bit of Deer by Gorillas and uh then we'll play a bit of Tender by Blur. All right. That's what we're playing next on Demon FM. Don't go anywhere. This is the Extra Large Mead and Cheese where we are talking about the film industry. This is your student sound. Demon FM. live stream after hello, hello you are back to the mead and cheese film hour yeah so um yeah welcome back we have had a we've had a um we've had a really great conversation here today with Corey west who works at showcase we've talked about uh about the future of the film film industry, uh, the future of this uh, in terms of distribution, and now um, we've talked actually even about Corey, who might set up his own cinema called the Sundial Sundial Cinema, and that is very interesting stuff. Um, but just if you like this, you know we can keep doing this as a regular podcast. That's the plan, uh, where we're going to talk to different people in the media industry, talk about their experience, their ideas. Like I did not know that Corey had an idea to make a cinema, and some of how unique it is. So keep in tune with us. Um, in the next hour or so, we're going to now move on to like our gaming chat. But um, keep keep um, keep keep updated. Um, next week, I think in the next few weeks, we're going to have someone talk about sustainability in the media industry which i think is a very relevant topic so i hope you've enjoyed this i hope you found this valuable and if you're a brand who wants to come on this show and talk to us about your ideas um give us a message absolutely i can agree with that 100 percent. and uh, yeah i think that the idea for the film podcast is a great one so uh, just to advertise the podcast, what is the podcast going to be called? Where can people find it? <laughs> I um, I actually don't have a name. I was just thought the media re- the media business podcast, the media business podcast behind the business. I don't. I'm I'm not sure. Dream Visual Podcast. Yeah, I mean, you put up a post earlier, didn't you, on your own social media? Yeah. Um, if I can go find that now. 
Uh, you you put up. We are starting a media business podcast next week uh, on the Dream Visual and Daydreams Architect social medias. And we did it this week, so we are ahead a week. Well, yeah, this was this was the special preview for it on uh, on Mead and Cheese. Yeah, but uh, yeah, when when you when you fully launch this new podcast, I think that's uh, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. So we're either going to do it as a morning radio show, mm-hmm. and then just have it as a chat show, so then we can have guests come in here. Or um, I think it might be one what moves around. It's very because it's a quite guest focused show. I think like in terms of getting people on it, you've got to sort of work to their schedules a bit. But there is some flexibility in the Demon FM schedule. There's also the audio boost in case someone can't actually make a date what works in here. But um, yeah. I, I'm hoping to get loads of different guests from the industry on. Um, to talk about, I'm going to talk about my experience working as a videographer and trying to launch my own company, Dream Visual, <clears throat> and how we can support brands. But I also want to hear like people like you who worked for Showcase, and it's quite interesting because like, you've told me some things that I've not come across before. Well, here's the thing. I, I just work for Showcase as um, you know, just one of the employees behind the bar. But um, I have been talking to the managers at Showcase about, you know, maybe some of them coming on mead and cheese. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you wanted to get a manager from Showcase on your show uh, about the film industry, I feel like they'd probably bring a lot of insight. Yeah, to yeah, that definitely. As well. I think I think that would be a very interesting guest. Like even if maybe you could even get a situation where you have like one independent cinema manager and one um big big time, you know, showcase like cinema manager mm-hmm. and see what sort of like different ideas they have about running cinemas. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I think this is, um, you know, it would be great for, for Demon FM um, yeah. to have to have a show like this. And I think it would be great for, for you personally as well. Yeah, there's always that personal thing. It's to kind of, it kind of promotes my brand, to be honest. But um, like next week, like, um, not next week, a few weeks time, we're going to, the sustainability episode, like some of them things I've already took on board, like one thing was is about replacing AA batteries, so like normal standalone AA batteries with rechargeable ones because that's more, you know, that lowers your carbon footprint. But um, I'm really excited because like it's, the film industry is quite a big polluter, so it'd be interesting to f- figure out ways how you could actually make a sustainable video production company and if it can actually be done. I suppose one debate you could have about sustainability is that of uh, physical media. Yeah. Because obviously physical media uh, produces a lot of plastic. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know about yourself, but I'm someone who likes physical media, who likes having yeah. physical media. I do too. Yeah, it's... it's. I mean, as long as you're going to keep it... I mean, if you do it with metals, it's more sustainable. But also, like, for like a film... I, I've just come off a film production and... You know, the amount of paper I printed, like scripts, schedules, and like these things change on a daily, they're daily changes. Like we will change, you know, we change things in the schedule right up until the hour before we shoot. So, mm-hmm. you, and I'm printing things like an hour before we shoot. And, you know, the amount of day copies you get, and that's wasting a lot of paper. And I, my goal was to actually reduce the amount of paper my video production company will use that's one of my goals but like just working on this film as the producer it is a hard thing to do you know so i'm quite excited to take this problem to someone who works in sustainability to see how they would approach it because you do need this information like the schedules and stuff and scripts but how can you make it you know more sustainable well i know that when i uh, worked with kieran shea yeah um on his film as uh, as as an, as an actor, he he sent me the script as a as a Google Doc. Yeah, and um, you know, obviously with a shared Google Doc, you can uh, do live updates on it. So anytime they changed the script, they would change the Google document. Uh, everyone involved in the making of the film had access to that Google document, um, so they they didn't have to keep reprinting stuff. And I think that's probably more sustainable. So my sort of thing with that is. We weren't just doing a one day shoot. It was um, this process took a long time. So um, they would need the script for 
rehearsals. This is Leicester's Student Sound. Demon this FM. is Leicester's Student Sound. So yeah, um, yeah, what, yeah. So <laughs> what I was saying is like when you're doing like a one shoot where it's like quite a small crew, you can get away with just having that one script. But we had like a script supervisor who would make changes to do with continuity. We were doing rehearsals uh, the week before. I can't, I can't see it would affect things because, um, like I say, the Google document is shared. Everyone has access to it on their own devices. Like we all had our phones. Um, if we needed the script, we could just get our phones out and look at the script. The, the thing, the difference is like um, we can't do that uh, because um, you know you people want a physical copy like of the script, and if we've made a change from one day, could we're shooting for multiple days. If we've made one change, we have to reprint that script and yeah. then. Um, give that script to the actors because they need an updated version because they write notes on it they and they don't you know say say if their phone breaks or like you can't really have your phone connected to the internet either um on because it's um it can if it interfere with the audio equipment it's quite a tricky one um but it's not just the script it was more the schedules what was printing lots of as well it was the amount of schedules we were printing because they were changing on the day. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. I, as an actor, in all the stuff I've worked on, haven't had a physical script. You've never had a physical script? No, I've had a physical script. I'm, I'm saying I haven't had a physical script in a while. In a while? You know, all of the scripts I've had in all of the stuff that I've been in throughout the past three years... Um, has been uh, digital scripts. Yeah. And I, I do think that's do you, probably due to the uh, sustainability aspect that you mentioned. Do you mean on set, though? On set, say, if you was on set, would you have ever have a physical printed script to read off? Uh, say if you're rehearsing your lines. We'd get it up on our phones. As the actors, we would get the script up on our phones. Yeah, because I, I feel like, like if you if I did that to our actors... I feel like that's sort of like, because they're coming a long way, it feels like that's quite, you know, like that's our job is to provide them with a script, you know. Yeah, not but make I sure, mean, make a them... digital script is a script. Yeah, but it's like a lot of actors who I work with want to write notes, like beats on it. So like, you know, if there's something like stage directions they want to write, which you can't write on the actual document because it will mess with the actual formatting. They want to write a note here that... Mm. I will do this, you know, take 10 seconds to breathe, you know, take a beat here, um, you know, walk here with left hand, you know, pick this up with this hand. They'd write notes like that on it. Yeah, I get that. I mean, um, you know, I say in the last three years, I've not really had a physical script, uh, but the one time that I, I did, um, yeah, you know, you go through, you highlight things. Yeah, yeah, you hi know, you're highlighting. Yeah, as you well. Know, you you make notes, but I, I, don't, I don't think... A physical script is an absolute must. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's yeah. interesting though because, like, um, okay, I feel like it comes down to like the person as well. Like, some people do prefer looking things on the phone. I personally hate it. Like, I find like with particularly the schedules, I find having a digital schedule very hard to look at um, rather than the paper one. But because um, I can just when things are changing on the whim i always have it like out and i can just draw on on it so like for example if you're swapping a shot so we're doing this shot now rather than doing it in t in half an hour's time i can just draw readjust that really fast a lot faster with a pen than i would with like any computer yeah, I get that, but you know, maybe it's just because I'm a you know Gen Z uh, digital Gen. native. But yeah. um, to to me personally, I find doing everything digitally easier. You know, I, I don't like writing stuff down physically. I don't like physical you know paper yeah. and stuff. Um, to me, having it on a on a computer or a phone feels more natural. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. I mean, I think it is a preference thing as well, like however you work. Um, but yeah, it 
you know, because then I don't have to worry that I'm going to lose the script as well. Like, I, I've, I've had physical scripts before where I'll, I'll throw it in my bag and it'll just, like, get battered yeah. about and, you know, I'll the page will fall out or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, I don't have that, that worry with a, um, a, a digital one unless, you know, my phone explodes. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, it, it's it, again like I, I see the benefits and pros and cons in both ones i always think that you should have at least one script on set physical you know because in case um let's say someone's phone breaks someone someone you know you have one there you you know mm-hmm. to always work off like you should always have some of the data printed off yeah, at least one and, copy. you know, when it, like I say, in the past three years, I've not used many physical scripts. But uh, for the first module I did um, for performing arts here at uni, yeah, uh, we we all were given printed off physical scripts. Yeah, uh, because you know the first module that we did was more that traditional stage acting. Yeah, um, but then you know as we got more contemporary, uh, more experimental with stuff. Uh, the physical scripts just uh, kind of went out the window, um, and I know I know for like the second module, um, even for modules recently, you know, um, we we would have our own stuff on our phone, like what our own bits that we need to do. Yeah. Uh, but but I imagine, like you say, um, like the person like directing the whole thing would probably have a written copy of their own or something yeah. that has a full run of everything to yeah. go through you know just in case you know oh i forgot my phone um what what do i need to do at this bit and they could tell me yeah yeah that's like you see on the set that's the same with what we were doing we had like several people who were like organizational person like, i'm the producer so i had a folder just with all the contracts in and like a lot of people some people will sign it digitally some people won't but it's uh just again that depends on age but you know then you have someone we had an assistant director there who was great at keeping things on track but then you also have someone who's a script supervisor making sure like things errors like continuity errors aren't aren't happening and like yeah. keeping like notes of like the lenses and stuff like that down um like for example like the way we did it was um when you take a take when you film something you would write the script supervisor would write a note about that take so yeah. they would write if it was a good take bad take you know what lens it was on all the information so then the editor can go through that information and edit it more efficiently i know that when i did uh kieran's film um i, I learned a lot of stuff about the filmmaking process that yeah. i um you know didn't know before like um there, there was a point where um I don't know what it was, like a generator or a fan or something yeah. turned on um, halfway through a shoot um, and it made like a really loud like buzzing noise, like bzzz, you know. Yeah. And um, th- what they did was uh, they, they, you know, they stopped the, um, the shoot um, and they got the sound people and they, they just recorded the sound. Yeah, you can do that. Um, and they said, you know, Oh, we we record the sound just in case when we do more shots. Um, if the sound goes on for a while, we can add it to the earlier shots so that it's not out of place. Yeah, so that's so what the sound recorder should always do on a shoot is uh, do a wild track, which is yeah, that's what they call yeah. it. Yeah. So they take a minute and they film that like, the sound of the room and like so they pick up things like because like say if you it's for like say if, particularly say if you get you need to redo your lines and you have to sync that you know to the audio of your mouth you then have to then re put the audio of the room in so you have to make sure you get you don't record because if you record it in a different room the room will sound different but um things like fans and like even like things like you know like just the actual sound of the room is yeah, different like a ticking clock and stuff Another thing you can do, which I don't do often, is you can use, if you have like a, say if you're talking over the sound of the fan, and then you have a plain recording of the fan. Like, yeah. you, if you have that plain recording, you can use that plain recording to try and take that fan noise out as like a sample. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I don't think that's what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, they 
this sound came on. Maddie's granddad actually taught me. <laughs> so yeah. they told me about that trick. But yeah, the sound came on. They said, "Okay, we'll stop. We'll stop this take. We'll we'll record the sound for you know a few yeah. minutes or whatever, and then we can edit it into um, the takes that didn't have it." Yeah. In. Um, because you know, having some takes with it and some takes without it would be very noticeable. Yeah, yeah, because it'll you go from one shot. It makes it, yeah, it makes it more seamless. Yeah, that's called a wild track. Yeah. Um, there's also like this is the stuff you would learn about in uh, Tom's <laughs> media industry podcast. Yeah, this is all stuff we can cover on this podcast. Um, just trying to think, what else did you find about the film in the Pros? Anything you thought was like what you didn't? I was didn't think would be there um it, it was an interesting process i mean you know that um it's it's not like being on a stage where yeah. you know if, if mistakes happen you you've just got to keep going and improvise around them yeah um you know uh it it, it was more stop and start um you know if if i made a mistake or if the people behind the camera made a mistake or anything um, they would just say, um, "Okay, cut that take. We'll we'll start again." Um, yeah. I, I think, like you watched the film, uh, the scene in the corridor where I start strangling Lou. Yeah. Uh, I think we must have like done about twelve takes of that. Yeah. You know, and that's just because you know they wanted to get the shot just right. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you know I might come out too early, or you yeah. Know, the, you know, there could be mistakes on the actors' end, the mistakes on the the cinematographers and there's no end of things what can go yeah. wrong this camera something can happen with the focus something can happen with that then there can be lighting or people coming by there's so much what can that's the thing when you like look at a scene or like a script you think oh this could be filmed in like x amount of hours realistically it's like double that like mm -hmm. our first day of shooting was really really uh, on the west end laundry i planned to shoot three days because that was how much i could afford within the budget and the first day was so much it took so long to get through a few scenes because you have issues what are like because you you know you get problems with the locations like mm -hmm. at one point so the location we went to wasn't we didn't have the guy who owned it there so they set the lights on a timer so they should have stayed on, but then they just went off and then you have to get them to come back and switch them back on because we didn't have control to the room with the lights. So things can really beat down your schedule and, you know, being sometimes, you know, working on the first day with a new crew, it, you know, things are slower the first day, people are getting used to things. But then the second day and the third day, they were rapid, like things were happening yeah. a lot faster. Yeah, I will say as well as the day went on, um, the amount of takes that we needed to do for things got less and less. Yeah, like yeah. Um, you get you get more confident as well. Yeah, it's not just it's not just that though, but like yeah, like towards the afternoon, I think partially because we were running out of time and they wanted to you know get everything shot. Yeah, but um, we 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 had a few what Kieran called uh, one and dones. Yeah, where um you know. We we would do a shot and um, they would say yeah that was that was great we don't need to do another take so that that's good um, I I think if the director doesn't feel like they need to take another take sometimes I think they should take another one for safety yeah we did do a, we did do quite a um, few of those as well yeah but like um, so what when when this is when it's really good to have an assistant director on set because you know, they can sort of, like, tell you how long that extra take's going to get. And like, if that extra take's going to, you know, stop you from getting a take later on in the day, it's sort of like you have to limit them. So sometimes, I think we limited some takes to, like, six. They say, get it in six takes or get it in four takes, you know. It, it, yeah, and another thing that I learned was, like, just the camera trickery of some things. Yeah. Like, you know... um there was quite a few um, violent scenes in the film, like where, you know, I'd get hit or yeah. Lou would get hit or whatever. And, you know, we never actually hit each other. But because of the camera angle and the sound design, yeah, um, you know, it looked like we were hitting each other pretty hard. And where and where can people watch this film? Is it is it premiere? I, um, I don't think it's been made publicly available. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
if, if people really want to watch the film, my advice would be to contact Kieran Shea. Yeah. Um, and say that you're interested in watching the uh, film. student film Dead Air. Yeah. But uh, whether they'll make it publicly available, I don't know. It's, yeah, I suppose that's more down to what they want to do, uh, marketing wise. Uh, I I'll probably put the link on my portfolio when I uh, get around to editing that. So yeah. um, you know, well, if I do that and I put it up, people could probably go go there. But I I think one of the funniest things about making films is actually the marketing and distribution of it going back to what we we're talking about yet yeah, earlier like there's so many ways you can promote a film and like it's one of these i know for coursework sometimes you don't promote them films like i've had films what i've done which i didn't promote because it was portfolio but like when you it is a really fun thing to like work on the marketing on it it is like because you have to like organize festivals posters behind the scene videos it's like it can be really fun yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I think this is all a lot of great stuff that you can talk about in your film podcast. Yeah. Um, so do you have a plan for when you will do the first episode? Uh, next week, but I'm not sure what day. Okay. And uh, is there any thing people can follow to get updates on when uh, to tune in? If they follow Dream Video on Instagram um, or Facebook, um, so that's the handle is on Instagram www.dreamvisual. Is it www. This is probably that is my Instagram handle, right? Right, that Instagram handle you can follow us on is dreamvisual.co.uk on Instagram, or just type in dreamvisual on Facebook or YouTube, and you'll find us. Um, it's a Leicester-based video production company what we're starting up, and we want to try and just talk about, you know, because I feel like it makes it makes us better, you know, makes our practices better as a as a videography and photography company but also it's it's interesting for our audience to sort of see this behind the scene look yeah dream and media yeah um <laughs> yeah i i think it's a great idea and obviously people could follow uh mead and cheese and we'll tell people um about your about your new podcast on there as well yeah the thing what people don't know all these mead and cheese hoist lemonade the east angelo um trade company c caps c caps uh, licky licky squad licky licky squad demon media demon media um or oh, this is the one is a recent one uh welsh space program Corey sundal cinema they're all interlinked they're all sort of yeah. a big they're a massive massive conglomerate which lord's enterprise yeah the lord enterprise lord's enterprise yeah is massive it's <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's a great thing to keep an eye on because maybe it'll be like the next uh, Tesla, maybe it'll be the next Amazon, you don't know. So yeah, definitely, definitely follow Mead and Cheese, follow uh, dreamvisual.co.uk uh, on Instagram. And uh, yeah, you will find out when you can listen to the the Dream Media podcast. Yeah, and it, it, will, it will be... Um, not it'll be uploaded on Instagram just as a audio file or, or visual file, and it will be uploaded on YouTube, probably Spotify, and all your you know all your regular links. Exactly. So um, I think we're going to go to to a quick to a quick song. Um, you you have any requests, Tom? Uh, year three thousand. Year three thousand. Yeah, we'll 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 do year three thousand again. Nice. Uh, yeah, we'll do year 3000, and then when we return, we will be discussing video games, all things video games. Your great, great, great granddaughter is pretty, pretty fine. fine. Well, that was... I, I just want to, before we go into the next segment, I want to just say, like, this has been a quite a long day, but it's gone really fast. It has. It, it hasn't felt like a yeah. five-hour episode. Which makes me feel like I could probably... Like, because like, obviously we do meat and cheese two hours. I mm. feel like we could extend it. Like, like we got we had an in, but not just with meat and cheese. We've had an interesting talk about you know the film industry, the podcast. We've had an interesting talk earlier on about the elections, and we've had, we're going to have an interesting chat now about gaming. Yeah. And I just think like we could probably you know have a daily sort of like a day length podcast. 
I oh, think right. um, I think we just make rag a twenty four hour meat and cheese. Well, yeah, this is what we've done five hours. That's that's nearly half of what we want to do with rag. Exactly. I mean, I think if Mad, uh, we're talking going back to Maddie's plans, I think she plans on doing a twenty four hour broadcast on the radio. Just she wants to do twenty four hour visual broadcast. Yeah, and I'm totally I'm a hundred percent behind her. If she wants to do that. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, every time we do mead and cheese, um, and it is just a two-hour show, I always come out of it thinking, oh, I, I could do more of that. I could do that for another yeah. hour or so. Yeah. And uh, I, I still feel that today, I think. Like, you know, even though it's been a long episode, it's not felt like yeah. a long episode. We've got, like, what, 40 minutes left? Yeah, we've only got 40 minutes left, and uh, we are going to spend that 40 minutes talking about gaming. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Tom, what is your favourite video game console? Uh, I don't know. This is a hard one. I think I think it goes to the Xbox 360. The 360. Yeah, like it, in terms of like nostalgia wise, um, that's the one for me because it's the one where I started gaming properly with my friends, mm-hmm. and I, I do say that the Xbox 360 is better not to get into that console war debate but it is better than the ps3 purely based for me purely based on one thing was party chat and remember when i was playing gaming it's not like today where i can just you know call a facebook group and they're all there it, the technology was limited back then yeah i mean xbox party chats really were a great thing for the time yeah like i would go on just to talk to my friends like you mm. like are they online you'll talk to them it was it was a social media as a as in a way and you it know. was yeah it, it really was it was a, a great social platform and you know i i made many friends through xbox yeah um and a lot of my friends at the time we were all on xbox 360 and uh yeah party chats were the main way we socialized outside of school yeah like and then we'll go and games together but then we'll just chill you know maybe even watch a film i don't know but my problem with the ps3 back in the day was it didn't have that it didn't have party chat no and the um ps3 online obviously xbox live uh cost a monthly subscription yeah uh, and ps playstation network was free but uh, PlayStation Network at the time was also very vulnerable to cyber attacks and uh, was down for maintenance quite a lot as well. Yeah, it it also like so like I had a friend, I had a few friends who were PS3 on the console, and people like I'm not against one console. No, I like both consoles for different reasons. Uh, but like when when you're on when you got on a mate when you got a mate on PS3 to talk to them online on a headset, you, what you have to do is you. A, you both have a have a headset. Have a headset. It's it's a rarer thing to buy a headset for a PS3 because you just don't need them as much because you don't have party chat. But um, yeah, that and you know the Xbox 360 was the dominant console at the time. So yeah. all the headsets and peripherals you would see in the shops were for the 360. Yeah, and I think I feel I have a feeling not sure the PS3 ones might have been more expensive. The P- the PS3 when it first launched was very expensive. Yeah, it was yeah. it was uh, more expensive than the 360. Um, the PS3 did make a comeback towards the end of the generation, and uh, eventually ended up outselling the 360 um, due to um, you know the big price cuts and uh, the big amount of exclusive games that Sony put out. Yeah, their exclusives like Last of Us are really good. Um, mm. I. Big Planet, Little Planet was also pretty good. Uh, yeah, and the graphics were better. Like, the, they could do more, particularly towards the end. They they packed a punch a bit more. Yeah. But, like, the whole thing was... The only way I could ta- talk to, like, Jimmy was, like, let's say we would both have to have the same game mm-hmm. to talk and then go in that party chat in that. Like, so say that we both have, have to, to do game it. chat. Yeah, game chat. And like, or you could just wait in a lobby, but that's not ideal because sometimes you don't always have the same games. That is another great thing about Xbox 360 at the time and Party Chat, because obviously you talk about on PS3 having to join a lobby. Yeah, and uh, you know, you, any any person could join a lobby, and you could get like random like two year olds like join and start yeah. screaming at you. 
But, you know, on Xbox, if you joined, like, a lobby of, like, say, Call of Duty Black Ops or something, and, you know, you've got, like, little 12-year-olds screaming at you, yeah. um, you know, you just say, you just start a party, you're in your own chat, um, you can set it to invite only, and then, you know, you, yeah. you don't have to listen to anyone yeah, screaming. you don't have to mute everyone, do you? No, you don't have to go through and individually mute anyone, you just start a party. Yeah. Which is, you know, it's a lot more convenient. I I do think PS Plus is was or was better. I've not really looked at it recently, but it was better on them Xbox equivalent to that because you know you'd get like free games that like, each month to download to play. And you you got that on Xbox as well. Yeah, that yeah you do now. You didn't before. It wasn't you, as good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but now I'm not. Look, I've never looked at the Xbox One one. My brother said it's good. It's on. Get, get, I think it's Game Pass or something. Game Pass is amazing. But um, I'm not sure how Game Pass works. But the one I've looked at recently on PS4 that was amazing because you could stream old games and just play them. Uh, are you talking about PlayStation Now? There's yeah. There's two. There's PlayStation Now and another one which was PS Plus. So one. PS Plus, I think, gave you like a like a monthly game which was recent, you know, like a yeah. recent. PlayStation Now was a um, like a library of like loads of PS3 games and old PS4 games which you could just play and like stream. Yeah, um, I know. I know on Xbox, um, obviously, Xbox Live on 360 had uh, games with gold. Yeah, and uh, that was two free games every month. Yeah, I think I might have, maybe have done that. Um, uh, and on the Xbox One, it's um, I think they still keep the two three sixty games, so you get three free games a month. Um, I think it's one Xbox One game and two Xbox three sixty games. I don't think Games with Gold is on the Series X yet. Um, probably because there's not. A lot of new games coming out yeah. on the PS5 and series consoles to you know warrant doing that. Well, it's hard um, to get a PS5 at the minute. Yeah, that and of course the the um, Xbox Series X is backwards compatible with the Xbox One as well, and yeah. the PS5 is compatible with the PS4. So you know if. Microsoft and Sony just keep giving you free Xbox One and PS4 games. You can still use those on your new gen consoles. Yeah. But, well, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, the big thing, because you spoke about PlayStation Now and how you could stream old, like, PS1 and PS2 games and stuff like that. Um, you know, on, on the Xbox, they, they pushed massively for backwards compatibility. Yeah. Uh you know where you can you can go to the Xbox store and you can you know buy um an original Xbox or a 360 game. Yeah. And you know if you've got Game Pass now as well, you can just download that game for free. Well, not for free cuz you're paying a monthly subscription for Game Pass, but you know you can download that game uh without you know buying it and you can stream it uh, through XCloud as well. Um but where Microsoft beat Sony in this aspect is obviously the Xbox One um, is backwards compatible with the original Xbox and the Xbox 360, and you can even use your original discs on yeah. the Xbox One. If you have like the original Star Wars Battlefront laying around for the original Xbox, you can grab that disc, put it in your um, Xbox One or even your Series X, and it'll play in like yeah. you know up res graphics. Yeah, and I, I like that because I they, they they had a while where they were gonna try and remove the disk drives off all Xboxes before they released the Xbox One, but it was so unpopular because people like trading in games. I, I love trading in games. I haven't done it as much like you. Do, I do buy more games online now, but back in the day, I would never ever ever buy a game online because I'd always get the disc because I'd always trade it in. That's that's the thing. We we live in a digital age now where physical media is becoming less and less prevalent. Yeah. And, you know, the gaming industry is following suit with that. Um, both Sony and Microsoft have um, consoles without disc drives. Yeah. 
I will get the ones. So I, I, I get. I know that's like where it's slowly edging towards or fastly edging towards. But I still like the fact I can go into a shop and buy a game and then hold that game and then put it in. It's exciting. Exactly, and I think Nintendo are really the champions of this because yeah. um, you know Nintendo games are still on cartridge on the Switch. Yeah, yeah. And um, the Nintendo game cases are very small. The cartridges yeah. are very small. Um, and unlike the um, Xbox and the PlayStation, where it's on a Blu-ray disc and you have to put the disc in and you have to wait for the game to install off of the disc to be able to play it. Yeah. With Nintendo, you just put the cartridge in and you can play it straight away, like in the old 360 days. Yeah. I suppose so Nintendo games, they're on a smaller screen, um, but also the graphics are not as good as uh, Xbox One or yeah, PS4. Yeah, I mean, for, for multi-platform games, that is generally true. Like, you know, the Nintendo Switch is nowhere near as powerful as an Xbox One or a PS4 or, you know, the new gen consoles. But, you know, it, it's more powerful than a 360. It's more powerful than a PS3. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's not completely underpowered. You can still get games like, you know, The Witcher 3 on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The old, I, don't, I don't see... The, I, I played The Witcher 3 on, on Switch. I don't see it as a... The graphics as massively bad. Like, like I, I can see they could be better. Like, but um, I, I like it for what it is. It's a nice concept. It's a very, like friends it i think as a console it does commute like gaming as a group better um yeah maybe not online uh, no. because nintendo's online service isn't very good no no, no i don't mean you know I, th this goes back to our discussion yeah. about the 360 versus the ps3 like nintendo don't have party chat yeah or no, anything like that I, i've never used the nintendo as a um, online multiplayer game that's not what i meant well, for in person yeah. yeah in person i mean like the fact you can have like multiple controllers and actually play a game like a board like mario party together i feel like that it's a very like like a board game almost i think console. because it's a hybrid console as well obviously you know i can take my nintendo switch to my friend's house yeah um a lot easier than i can take an xbox to a friend's house yeah it's and, handheld and you know because it has that handheld side of it, you know, I take my Switch to my friend's house, he's got his Switch, um, you know, we, we could all meet up with our Switches on the yeah. park, you know, and have Pokemon battles and stuff like you would do back in the DS days. Um, and you you can't do that with a with an Xbox yeah. or, or, or a PS4. There is a console which I've got my eyes on, which I really want, um, I don't know if you heard of it, which I think could be a competition for both the both the Switch um, and Xbox, PC, and um, PS4. Go on. And that is the Steam Deck. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know about the Steam Deck. I think it's um, I think it's overhyped. I, I don't think it's it's going to be worth the price that you pay for it. Uh, Look, the personally, I would uh, yeah, I would stick to PC and do my handheld gaming on the Switch. I, I definitely, I'm a massive fan of what they're doing here, to be honest. Like, I like the idea, because like, the problem with the Switch is, I, right, so the only time I could imagine gaming, like, frequently is either, well, if i am not got a lot on work-wise, so I'm, um, you know, just spending more time with the game, or I'm travelling, because I don't, like, when I'm on a long train or a long flight, I like the idea of being able to game. And I think this, the problem with the Switch is it doesn't offer many games I would play, but the Steam Deck offers everything on Steam. So, and that's a lot of games I would play. I like a lot of games on Steam. There's pretty much anything you can get on an Xbox or PS. That That's true, but then also, you know, um, if I'm on the go, like travelling, like yeah. you say, and, you know, I've not got my Switch with me or anything, um, I, I, I would just play games on my phone. And... You so, know, I, I know, I know what you're going to say. Yeah. Mobile gaming isn't the same. Yeah, and I'll agree with you, but I'm going to counter that point and say um, Microsoft and Xbox. If you have Xbox Game Pass and the Xbox app, you get access to X Cloud. You could play Xbox games through the cloud on your phone. See, that would be too much hassle for me. Also, 
my my problem with that is the fact that it's not a console it is my phone i tried playing like a call of duty variation on my phone and i hated it because it was touchscreen i didn't like i like the fact i like the fact steam deck looks like a controller it it i mean i'm look. i'm just looking at the advert here it looks amazing like the ergonomics and it is like the switch it's designed like the switch so you can like put it into a dock mm. and then just play as you would the switch and just use a remote but also here's the thing you know you can use it as a pc as i say in the adverts because it is one so you could just put windows on there um because it runs yeah. and and the specs on it are very good as well aren't they yeah like so so you're looking for a 64 gigabyte one is this is the cheapest it's 350 pounds then the next one up is uh the ssd by the way 256 gigabyte ssd for 450 pounds yeah. and then the most expensive which is 569 pounds has a 512 gigabyte ssd which i think is probably the one i'll go for because you get more space um and you get like some of the exclusives apparently it's faster storage as well um but yeah then you you won't be able to get one till october 2022 at the minute because of you know backlog as you get with all consoles but what i like about it is you can get um so it runs i don't know what it's called you know how this mac os there's it's w- steam os isn't it on there they have steam os but it's powered through um wind just just looking it up it's i can't remember <laughs> I, I i can think of it it's like the one what's for linux 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 it's yeah. powered through linux so it has linux installed and that's has the steam os but um once you plug it in you can um you can install windows yeah because you can yeah. install linux from windows and then it makes me wonder and i've not looked this up it it looks like quite a it sounds like to me quite a powerful um um like laptop like but smaller well i wonder if you could use like premiere pro it's got 16 gig of ram i think premiere pro would run on it yeah yeah so my laptop runs that my um so and it's got a massive ssd which for gaming it's for gaming this ssd is so I'm wondering if you could use this console as an editing software. And as a gamer, a lot of gamers want to edit their games. I wouldn't call the Steam Deck a console, though. It's it's a PC hybrid. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not it's not a full-on console. Uh, but then, you know, I don't think true consoles really exist anymore. Like no. The, 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 the Xbox all con- and the PS5, they're both basically mini pcs at yeah this point and that's the question are consoles just becoming pcs now like are we is the yeah. next xbox gonna just be a pc is the next ps4 ps ps state playstation a ps6 let's say is that just gonna be a pc i think um microsoft are very much moving towards xbox as a service yeah. rather than a physical platform um you know with game pass and the xbox app yeah. Um, you know, I I could see a future where, you know, Xbox as a console doesn't exist. So Xbox is more like. But you know, you pay for an Xbox subscription to get games on your phone or your PC or or whatever. So, so Xbox is basically what Steam does. It kind of is at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it's not there yet because you still have the Xbox consoles. Yeah. And I know I read somewhere that Microsoft were even pushing to try and get Game Pass on PlayStation and on Nintendo Switch. You yeah, know, they they want get Xbox Game Pass to be like the Netflix of gaming. Yeah, like you pay a subscription and you have access to all these games. The, the subscription model is the future. Things are going to be yeah. subscription, and based. that's why Game Pass is so so great. But um, the thing is, they've got a lot of competition. Like Steam is established on the PC. But Steam isn't a subscription model. Yeah, but you, it, it's, it will be its competition. It's a, it's a large library of games. And, and and you can get games very, very cheap in the Steam sale. Exactly, and they're moving out into 
consoles as well and but like most steam users are pc and they've got the handheld consoles mm -hmm. what's saying in a year's time when xbox says okay we're building game pass now and we're gonna just you don't need a xbox you just buy a pc why should they go over to xbox and not stay in steam because most a lot most pc users are using steam i think pc users would use both i use both I have Xbox Game Pass, which I but do access you, on my PC. But do you have, have Xbox Steam? Game Pass because you have an Xbox? You know what? There was a period where I sold my Xbox. Yeah. Right. But I still kept Xbox Game Pass. Yeah. Because you get a bunch of free PC games with it as well. Okay. That's interesting. Because, because Game Pass... <laughs> is not just free Xbox games, it is also free PC games and free cloud games that you can play on your phone and yeah. anything. Um, and, you know, the PC game offering on Game Pass is quite large. And I have my Xbox account linked to my Steam account as well. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, m most people who game a lot on PC... Uh, will probably have both Game Pass and Steam. Possibly, like I don't. I, I had both a PS3, um, a PS. I, I mean, gamers love gaming, so I, I had PS3, Xbox, and I had PC gaming for a bit. It, yeah, here's the thing with Xbox, um, and we talk about it becoming more of a service. A, an Xbox is just a Windows PC with less functionality. Yeah, and at this, this is, point, this is like my question. Then. My sort of like so the Xbox original gaming console. That's what it was. It was designed to play games. Xbox 360 was gaming console. What was designed for like online gaming? You know, you interacted with people on that. You know, it, and it had like a few features like Netflix yeah. and a, like a YouTube. I think Xbox One was a multimedia console. That's it, what it they was designed to be an all-in-one entertainment yeah. center. Yeah, but it wasn't like a PC. I wouldn't. I say. mean, it kind of was though. It, it ran. It ran a more restricted version of Windows, and you know, an Xbox One. Would you be able to edit on Premiere Pro on it? Because that's you can't. And yeah. this is this is what I'm saying um, now. Where you know, having an Xbox, it's not you know necessary. Like I am a big fan of Xbox. I I like the Xbox consoles. But you know, if you have a really powerful PC. Having an Xbox console is redundant. You don't need Yeah. One. So the thing I think that they might keep an Xbox console is when they get to the point where it's basically just a PC, but why not have their own, basically, Xbox PC brand? Well, this this is what I'm thinking Microsoft should do, um, where they should go all out with just allowing you to use all the Windows features on an Xbox. Yeah. Because on, on the Xbox One... You can plug a, a uh, keyboard yeah. and mouse into it and play it like a PC. It, and yeah. it runs Windows. Well, it's this just do, a more restricted should, version of Windows. They, they should probably do what Steam Deck do, because what the Steam Deck doing... It, I agree. It has its own Xbox OS, a Steam OS, which I think... If, you're, if I'm out and about, I don't want to be messing around with Linux on the Steam Deck. I want to just have, you know, their sort of, like, based you know apps because they sometimes they run a bit more friendly like they're a bit faster you know they're a bit simpler you know to to run on the go and if you're in a mm -hmm. game if you want to feel like you're in that gaming world sometimes you don't want to see windows you know always a pal i i agree with you and what i think xbox should do is uh, you know bring out an xbox console a really powerful one like the series x like they yeah. have done uh, even add this to the Series X in an update, you know, you've got the Xbox OS, which is a restricted version of Windows, it is just Windows, but more restricted. Um, what I would do is, you know, when you boot up your Xbox, automatically it's in Xbox mode, you yeah. know, it's it's there with your games, ready to play games. I think you should be able to press a button on the menu that says put it in PC mode, and then you can use it just as a normal PC. Yeah, you know, and that, have that option. And that's what the Steam does. It's yeah, and that and that's the future. They sort of like that is the future. I think. Yeah. Um, do you think Xbox should do or PS? Well, PS Four Free did do it. They did PS Vita, um, which I really wanted, but they never released enough games for me to justify getting it. Mm. I was always saving up for them, but I never got around to getting it. Do you think Xbox should like try and make their own version of like I don't know the Switch or the Steam Deck? 
handheld. I don't think they need to because you know their their big focus is on X Cloud and you know just playing games on your phone, getting like a Bluetooth controller like slot for your phone to yeah. use as a handheld instead. Yeah, I I think if phones got bigger again, like they they were like so like the or even a tablet. Yeah, or something. But you know if if Xbox keep working in partnership with Nintendo and keep that partnership going like they have done yeah. and Game Pass does come out on the Switch that would be great wouldn't it that would be great for both Microsoft and Nintendo yeah like I feel like the the Switch is such a great concept like it's, yeah. it is a I think they could Xbox I've always thought like if you could have the Xbox game on a Switch console that would be amazing like yeah especially you know if You've got an Xbox game like Halo Infinite, which yeah. you know the Switch isn't powerful enough to play it. But if you if they're using Game Pass and X Cloud and you stream it onto your Switch, but here, here's the other thing though: I don't always want the most powerful console. Like the Switch mm-hmm. isn't the most powerful console, and I enjoy it for what it is. Like it is like I like the fact it's a bit restricted. I like the fact that you know you can always play. You know it's very specific because it makes. You know, it, it, sometimes the only thing I'd want from it more is just the ability to play, like, I don't know, the latest Assassin's Creed yeah. with good graphics. But, you know, as, as as we said about the Xbox, it really is, like, at the point where if you have a PC, you don't need an Xbox. Like, did you know that you can just fully play Xbox games on your PC now? Uh, like you, you can't put an Xbox disc in, but you know, like with Game Pass, like I said, you get the free PC games, but you can also just play Xbox games. I was playing the Xbox One version of Star Wars Battlefront Two, uh, the 2018 game. Yeah. Um, on Xbox Live with my little brother. Yeah. Um, in a Xbox party chat on my PC with an Xbox controller as well. I, I just fully used my PC as an Xbox. I didn't yeah. need to go on the Xbox, um, you know. And if you have a powerful enough PC, you don't need an Xbox at all. Yeah, it. My brother's has an Xbox One, but he is, he, but now he's brought a PC and he doesn't. Um, he doesn't. He doesn't use it. He doesn't use his Xbox anymore. He's gone off Xbox and now he's just using PC. Exactly. Uh, but like. There is a bit of nostalgia for me. Like mm-hmm. I liked the old. Like I liked the fact. Can't like it feels weird because like when I was getting the three sixty, you was thinking of how more powerful consoles would become, and I feel like they've hit this sort of like massive amount of power now. They're about to get there. You know, you can do anything on them. But I I kind of miss the days where it was restricted. You know, you could only do certain things on them. You and and I miss the fact that trading in games i miss i would go with my dad every like weekend and i'm trading some games buy some others and and that that part of it i enjoyed going to the game shop um or game station when it was existed um Mm. and buying games and like selling them i yeah i i think the trading of games is uh great just from a free market perspective yeah um you know uh, but the free of the market, the free as people. <laughs> exactly, um, but yeah, we're, we're kind of moving away from that. I do think retro gaming has been making a huge comeback. Yeah, and uh, you know, retro game collecting is more popular than it ever yeah. has been. Um, and I think that does have a lot to do with a lot of people's nostalgia for the consoles they grew up with. Like, our generation is now going back and buying PS2s and the original Xbox and things like that. And the GameCube. Yeah, I've literally brought Star Wars Republic Commandos, and that was the first... that I didn't buy it on Xbox. I have an Xbox. I think I still have the game on Xbox, original. But I brought back. I brought that game because, like, I I remember I got it. It was the first game I ever played. Star of Republic Commander. It's like a cool, like a. Sh- I don't know if you know it, but it's like a you're in a squad of four shooter, oh, yeah, yeah, shooter on Star Wars. And I never completed it. And I remember the reason I played it is because we had an Xbox magazine. My, my dad would get, and each week it would come with like a disc in it with a demo. Oh yeah, and you play the demo. I, mean, I played the first thirty minutes of it, and then, and then I, my dad eventually got it, 
and I played it, and it was like the first game I ever really played, like properly, which was like kind of like my game. Mm. I I was bad at gaming back then. I didn't complete it. I got like a, about maybe four or five misses in, and I brought it. I brought it now for the Switch, and I'm gonna p- complete it because I, I feel like I've got the experience. God, I remember demo discs. Demo th- demo discs were great. They they were so cool, especially like you say when you get them like as a bonus with a magazine or yeah. something, just in like a little cardboard sleeve. Yeah, like. yeah, it it it's such a like and, and that sort of like physical media um, aspect of it all is something I miss. I miss it as well. Like um, I I remember a time when uh, you know in the playstation 2 and original xbox days when you would go out to a shop and you would buy a big book full of cheat codes for a for a bunch of games yeah and you'd flick through it to find the game that you were playing and they'd have all the cheat codes listed in it oh. nowadays you know cheat codes aren't really much of a thing in games now anyway yes yeah. you know what used to be a cheat code to change your hair to be pink or something now they'd just charge you like 20p to buy it as a costume yeah, because it was something I always thought I'd never knew how cheat codes because you know, young mind, you don't know how it works. Something the game designers put in for because what it's happened? Just a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah. What 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 happened was one of my mates. I think it was GTA, not Vice City, San San Andreas, San Andreas, and yeah. one of my mates was once round who played games more than me. He just and and then something like he started like the car started flying. I think it was. Or something oh like. yeah, and I was yeah. like, how the how did I thought it was magic, and then I didn't think like the gamers would actually put that code in, and like, I thought it was just modding it. But um, no, yeah, I, I remember GTA San Andreas because obviously um, I used to play it as a as a wee lad, and. Um, I had the big Xbox cheat code book and I'd flick through to where it said GTA San Andreas and I'd put in all the cheats for like, you know, never die, flying cars, um, everyone is like trying to murder you, stuff like that. Yeah. It, and it was just funny, like you could put yourself, um, you could make yourself in a gimp suit if you wanted to. Yeah. It was, yeah. Um, and I miss I miss stuff like that. It's not really around in games anymore because, like yeah. I say, you know, the, I mean, we've got, got microtransactions and stuff. Yeah, you, as you say, I I never really thought of it that way. Like you said, you pay twenty p to change your hair, but also like in terms of like cheat codes, you can. I think the one thing what is good with like all this technology is like Skyrim and modding it, like like getting on like Nectus mods. And like just changing the game, whatever, like cause it gives loads of people the opportunity to actually change that game. Yeah, and that's another thing as well. Like consoles um, now have modding capabilities. Like you can get mods for Skyrim and Fallout on an Xbox or yeah. a PlayStation. Um, Xbox is better for it because it's less restricted than PlayStation. But, uh, yeah, with modding on consoles, I, I do think we're, we're at a turning point where consoles are just becoming PCs. Yeah, for sure. I think that's sort of like... The, I And I think that was always going to happen. Like, this, there's only so much you can do before it's just as powerful as a computer. Yeah, that's it. And I think, you know, um, PCs are the future. Um, uh, PCs and streaming are the future you, of gaming. The only thing I we've think. not really touched on, though, which just came to my mind now, is VR. I, d- I don't know if VR will be immensely popular until it gets really affordable. Yeah, I think I think it is an alternative, like to like you know, because VR you can't really do that with it. You can get you have to buy the tool to use it as a gaming console. You can run you can have a vr oculus i've got i've got an oculus at home um my dad got it for his birthday i love it it you don't play it as long you, don't, you i couldn't personally be there for as long as i would play on a normal console but yeah. it is absolutely amazing playing it for like 30 minutes or t- an hour like uh i played a walking dead game which was so it was like so immersive yeah i mean i went to a friend's once and i uh tried skyrim vr and um that was like a really fun experience because that was like one of my first experiences with vr yeah and i mean i kind of took the mick with it i, I didn't play the game seriously you, is I, it skyrim on vr 
yeah, Skyrim on VR on on the PS4 it was, and um, yeah, I didn't take it seriously. I kept yeah. like you know trying to like look under skirts and like just <laughs> mess around with the game as yeah. much as I could, you know, like do things you're not supposed to. But yeah, I think I think VR's fun. It just needs to become more affordable before it becomes mainstream. Yeah, it. I mean, I think we've got what Meta's doing, Facebook. I think then they really want to push VR on their massive company and they own Oculus and Oculus is generally like some of the stuff they're doing is amazing. Mm. Um, you can't get that type of experience on an Xbox. It's a different type of experience, so it's more yeah. immersive. But yeah, I think we should uh, continue this discussion about gaming on next week's episode of Mead and Cheese. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is unfortunately all we have time for on the extra large Mead and Cheese special. Yeah. I hope you um, enjoyed it. Yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. And, of course, uh, join us next week for another episode of Mead and Cheese. I've been DJ Mead. And I've been DJ Cheese. And uh, to end the show, we've been here for 10,000 hours. So we are playing 10,000 hours by Dan Plushay and Justin Bieber. <laughs>